Good morning, and you're welcome to Hashtag The Key Points. My name is Jifa Bampo. Great to have you and have your privilege of your company today, Saturday, 7th August 2021. My pleasure to bring you a discussion about all the major issues that came up in the course of the week. Today on The Key Points, Hashtag Fix The Country Demonstration. So what next? We'll be talking about that. Also, 29 years of the NPP, its reflections on Ghana's centre-right party. We are live on TV3 and 3FM 92.7, as well as live around the world uh, online at 3news.com. And you can also check us out on our Facebook page, that's at dot, uh, com, uh, TV3 Network, and on our Facebook page, TV3 Ghana. Between uh, now and then, we'll be happy to hear from you via our WhatsApp line. Our WhatsApp line is 055-369-8789. You can also tweet at us as part of the conversation at TV3 underscore Ghana, also at 3FM 92.7. And you can also tweet directly at me, at Beho Bampo. You can also message us on Facebook at TV3 Ghana, 3FM 92.7. So thank you very much for joining us this morning on The Key Points. Follow us with the hashtag, hashtag The Key Points. We take a break and we'll be right back. You're welcome back. And it's the key points on TV3 and 3FM. So on Wednesday, the much anticipated uh, Fix the Country demonstration happened. And it was really clear. It was a non-partisan, anti-NDC, anti-MPP, anti-establishment demonstration where many uh, you know, sought to project what their views were. So evidently, it was a success. And most importantly, it was peaceful. Attendees represented a cross-section of society, young and old, tradespeople, educated people, you know, ministers of the gospel and professionals, the every man and every woman of our society. And it's been a forceful representation of the frustrations that many Ghanaians are facing today. And among their prime demands, uh, a new constitution for a new generation, demanding the expunging of Article 71 from the Constitution, the creation of a movement that resists political intrusion, you know, that creates a citizen-led change uh, for governance, and also to address our systemic failures, the problems of unemployment, bad roads, insecurity, all of these, uh, quite a tall order, the movement wants addressed by the current NPP government. And I'll be introducing our panel shortly, but let's bring you uh, some sights, sounds, and a report from that Fix the Country demonstration on Wednesday. 72, Solomon Kwaukume has longed for a day like this to make his advocacy for the oil sector, he says, has been fraught with several challenges. It's an opportunity I've been waiting for for the past 12 years. And the opportunity has arrived for me to come out, to join the youth, to tell the youth that the day is a historic day for them to liberate themselves from the shackles of economic exploitation. Aided by his walking stick, he marched all the way through to the Black Star Square in solidarity with the movement. <laughs> His fellow septuagenarian is Akusia Yeboa, who is barely holding up. They were young people, persons with disability, those who had traveled from the Ashanti, Easting and Volta regions. 
say, ye be PRS, ye catch and say, since he was able to tell the late president to fix Ghana, to fix the economy, we are telling him to fix Ghana for us. We are tired. The youth of Ghana, we are suffering. Look at me. Look at me. I'm a construction man. That is why I brought this one. Look, how much is cement? Today, it's 50 cities. 50 cities. Look, when are, when are we going to build? I'm a teacher at Obuase. You have changed the curriculum for about two years, but you have uh, given a textbook syllabus. Several times I lost my colleagues as the crowd thickened, but the people were determined to make this one count. Never mind the sweat and distance, the protesters spoke. Nobody was to be left out. We are against the bad leadership of this nation, the bad governance of this nation. Now at this, our church members, when they come to church, they can't give offering. They can't pay their tithe because all our members are broke. There are no jobs in this our nation. Turn after turn, the conveners address the crowd. Today, we are assembled here to protest against the system. But arguably the most emotional was this one from the eldest daughter of a slain activist in Nigeria, Mohamed Kaka. If my uncle is the true justice, you have a reason to believe for convenience of a protest, Wednesday's action is only the beginning of an awakening. We are calling for the abolition of the Sakawa 1992 constitution. And we are gathering one million names and signatures of Ghanaians who are with us on that part. By the time we are done, the 1992 constitution can no longer hold the legitimacy over us. The group hopes to sustain the momentum and drive until the system is fixed. And that report was filed by Komla Adum and Mawina Egbeta um, about the Fix the Country demonstration on Wednesday. Well, our panel today, Oliver Baka Vomawa, he is a convener for the Fix the Country movement. He's also a private legal practitioner and academic. We have Mami Awinado. She's a consultant with Blackbridge Consulting as well, focusing a lot on trade. Also, Dr. Soji Soji Tete who is a council chair for the Center for Social Justice, a young panel talking about wishes for a new generation. Thank you all very much for making time to come in on a Saturday morning and for joining me for the first time on The Key Points. Thank you for having us. All right. So um, just quick preliminary comments I'd like to take from each of you about two key issues that have been uh, raging yesterday as at the time we completed our production. So the University of Ghana, uh, KNUST have uh, adjusted the academic calendars. Exams are suspended for the moment because of a strike action, as well as the uh, parliamentary debate about the report on the Sputnik V probe, where we procured uh, some 300,000 uh, Sputnik V vaccines, paid an advance payment. However, that was all not evident in the probe. So, Dr. Soji Teta, I'd like to start with you, your, your immediate comments on first... Um, the University of uh, Ghana and KNUSD strike? Well, I think it's very unfortunate that we keep having these cycles of industrial unrest. Of course, you know my background from the Medical Association and the fact that most often than not is the government reneging on some of its promises. So at this point, I think that the Labor Commission needs to go beyond just making a declaration about the legality or the illegality of the action and call both parties and really ensure that where agreements have been flouted, and not you know, implemented, they get the government to get back on track. Because at the end of the day, it's the students that end up suffering. Yeah. And what about the Sputnik V probe? You are with the um, Center for Social Justice, and a bit of the work you do is also focused on health and addressing issues relating to health. I mean, we've been very concerned about the whole matter pertaining to the vaccines. You know, when you talk about the prices at which we were purchasing them, it was clear that it was way above even the market rate. So we're quite happy that the matter was being looked into. And the impression one got from the initial um, representation by the health minister was that we have not made any financial commitments. And now we seem to be getting different information. I think that we need a full-scale probe into the matter. Let's establish the facts. And I would hope that once the facts are established, the necessary actions will be done aimed at 
sanitizing the leadership system and then also recouping whatever funds have been paid out, especially as we are not getting the vaccines. Yeah, thanks very much. So, um, Mami, now another strike and also another probe that has emerged that we've advanced monies that, let's face it, resources are hard for us as a country. Your, your thoughts on those? Yeah, I mean, um what can I say? I mean, my, my number one concern is actually the students. I mean, of course, like, the labor force and what, like, the, their needs and their requirements are very important. I'm just thinking of the fact that it's unfortunate that in a time such as this, you have, um, you know, these young people who have, like, you know, have dreams and goals and aspirations, right, at the, at the they become victims, right, to a very weak and broken system. So I'm really hoping that something tangible and long-lasting, sustainable solution can be found to the problem. But it's just sad, like, at a time such as this, when they have exams, to, they're already talking about the fact that COVID already affected their, like, their curriculum, right? Already COVID, you know, everyone took it concerned the because already sector. even, yeah, pre-COVID, they finish school and they don't even have jobs, right? Yeah. And, and, so, and then their skills are already questionable. And so how much more when there's something like this? So I'm even looking at the long-term repercussions of this. Mm. So I'm really hoping that sooner than later this can be addressed. But Any yeah, thoughts on Sputnik V? Yeah, I was, I was wondering. I mean, I think when it comes to even procurement or something like this, there should have been more involvement of public administrators. Like, I'm just wondering how even the procedure and also even beyond the money like um look at the fda element like whether you know like just like the recklessness with it we are looking at human lives i mean look at how other countries have taken this thing so serious in the wto you have in Gozi busy act like you know advocating right with um developed states that african countries can have these vaccines you know like um without having to pay so much for patents and it's like here we are playing games with having is a shake. I'm just very confused when it comes to human yeah, life. Like, there were three entities involved. But it's yeah, very confusing. I'm quite just like, confusing. Yeah, yeah, are we really playing games with people's lives? Like, it's quite, it's concerning. So I'm really hoping. Certainly part of the things that we need to fix as a country. So Oliver, I guess this sits squarely within the scope of some of the things you would like to see changed, believe? I, I feel like in some respects, I've become the apostle of what needs to be fixed in this country. <laughs> <laughs> but... You know, I think the bigger question regarding, first of all, let me start with the university issue, is that we, we've quickly become a republic that thrives on crisis. And that instead of anticipating the problems, instead of dealing with them, we have to force, force people into a box. We have to make them feel that like they have no other option to, to cause a massive disruption to the academic calendar. And why do we thrive on those? Why do we elevate those moments of crisis as the only time when we are inclined to sit at the table and have a conversation. And this is reflected in so many aspects of our lives and perhaps reflects the conversations we are having around fixing the country as well. <laughs> the vaccine. So yes, I, I, a lot of the sentiments which have been expressed resonate with me. I was one of the people marching in Cambridge against AstraZeneca asking for developing countries to get vaccines. And to see the extent to which we despite the efforts being put by so many people and so many stakeholders in liberalizing vaccine procurements and all those issues, we continue to make a mess of the pandemic in total. And I do think that the, the call for a broader look into the issue should surpass vaccine. It should go to the entirety of the pandemic response. And I say this because I'm reminded when the Minister of Health came before Parliament for vetting, he said that when the pandemic first hit, he had convened an interministerial committee to set up responses, and that they convened three meetings and none of the other ministers showed up. And I wondered to myself, in a global pandemic, when Ghanaian lives are threatened, our members of um, our ministers cannot even act together to be able to finance responses. Then there's something wrong with the way in which we, we approach governance in total. And I think those are the questions we need to look at again and again. Going forward, yeah. Thanks very much uh, for those preliminary uh, comments. Now let's dig deep into the demonstration and what the aftermath looking into the future could be. Um, I'll start, I'll say with you, Oliver, briefly on that. So you issued a statement or the movement issued a statement after the demonstration indicating that it was, you know, a success. Uh, it, it reflected the views. You thanked people for coming out in, in a nonpartisan way to, you know, affirm all these issues that had been raised. I guess the important thing I saw was in point five, that the demonstration coming off eventually reflects a, a determination of the people in spite of the use of legal and state means to stifle uh, this process. You met the IGP afterwards, I understand. Are you surprised there's been no reaction, no major comment 
from government, from Jubilee House, from the Ministry of Information? No, I'm not surprised because I do think that, and perhaps it ties me into this conversation around waiting for crisis, because these conversations around fixing the country and the issues we've been raising have been in the public domain for almost four months now. So I'm not particularly expecting that the demonstration must provoke a reaction from them. A lot of people do. But I do think the way in which the issue should be reacted to should even start and predate the demonstration. So we did not see that. And I'm not expecting that they're going to change rhetoric around this. The president has barely spoken about this issue. So it's not going to surprise me. We are continuing to do what we want to do. Because we've always said from the very beginning that the conversation we want to have is with the people of Ghana themselves. They own the democracy. And the process must engage them. So there's really no rush on our end. And we don't see it in any particular way as a failure of government that like hasn't spoken to us. Because they are not our audience for this process. Mami, mm. are you um, surprised at the turnout? I mean, many of us were waiting with bated breath as to whether really would people come out. Mm -hmm. uh, do really people really affirm what the movement has been saying because this started as an online activity lots of young people heavily engaged online i i don't know about baka but maybe soji and i we were B we are bbc born before computers so <laughs> i i get the sense was would other people other than young people engaged um on a tech level mm -hmm. come out yeah i know i mean i wasn't surprised i think that even probably maybe more people would have if people were not feeling the brunt of what the economy is right now. I know people who are like saddled so much with debt, with problems, that even the idea of even going on the road, you know, I don't know if you understand like the idea of like, because I was even talking to somebody the day before and it's like, hey, I have to pay my work. It's like the stress of it alone to even get up and even go on the street. So even to see people who went there, first of all, kudos to them that they've had the, the agency to express what they are feeling with the country. I, for one, for example, I have just been, I think I've been t talking on social media for like a few years now. And you get to a point where you're asking yourself that. Is it getting anywhere? And I don't feel that way. Because they've been sharing, and you go on platforms, and we talk. Because Ghana, we talk a lot. So you're asking yourself then, what is the next step? or the next strategy, right, beyond the speaking. So first of all, I could also people we really now being able to like get up. I, you know the best part of the protest for me when I was even watching when I had time was when they were educating the people about the history. Because people need to be informed. Knowledge is power. But the thing is that we need to also be careful because now that people are getting informed and they know they're going to ask for better. And are we positioned to give them that? If not, because you have placed people in a position where they don't have so much to lose, right? Because right now, people don't have jobs. Life is hard. And then now, they're getting informed about the fact that it can be better. And I can't have a right to ask for more. And then you're not giving them that. If we don't respond, and our government doesn't respond effectively to like even start engaging people, we are sitting on a ticking time more. Because now, you know the Arab Spring? It's like, you cannot, this generation, I think they're exposed to so much. Like, they see everything. You're seeing what life can be for you. And we've seen it with the Olympics, those who have left, seen a lot of Africans or, you know, people of African descent running for developed regions, you know, and, and for Arab states. And you have seen that people now are looking at like, hey, I can have a better life, right? Why not? But yet you are not giving them something to live for. Yeah. If you don't, you're placing ourselves in a very Dr. dangerous Dr. Swati certainly um, these issues being raised are not new. Um, I know that we've had issues even from the 60s, then in the 70s. I mean, uh, people left the country because of issues like this, the economic issues in the 70s, in the 80s, similar. And now we are in the years, the millennial years. What for you is the reason why we still have to be talking or agitating about these issues? Should we be disappointed? maybe in the path we've taken, maybe democracy hasn't yielded the fruits we thought it would? I mean, clearly, having participated in the demonstration, the disappointment was clear. And in the beginning, there were those that asked whether we could transition from a social media agitation to actually putting boots on the ground. But when you arrived on the site, it was just clear that it was a totally different ballgame. I was really struck by how individuals that I did not know would walk up to me and I don't explain. think anybody who, most of the people who came to that 
event knew that knew who they were like they didn't know each other yes and they would explain with a lot of anger a lot of frustration about how the system was not working mm -hmm. they would point out potholes to me they would point out dilapidated buildings and they would talk about the role of government but i think your question is why now and is it really new i don't think it's it's new but Ghanaians have become used to i think a certain eight-year cycle We've talked about the past. The 1992 constitution was supposed to bring an end to all of these incidents of field governance. It was supposed to be a new beginning. It was supposed to deliver a certain promise of democracy, so to speak. Now we have all the trappings of democracy, and yet we do not deliver that promise. People go and vote, but they don't have the jobs. You know, we have parliamentary committees on public accounts. And yet we see judgment decks. We see governments entering into contracts without due process. We see governments abrogating all sorts of contracts and 80% of judgment decks resulting from these contract breaches. And yet there is absolutely no accountability. We live in a system where there's provision for an auditor general every year to audit public accounts. So actually you do have the evidence of public sector corruption and there is no remedial action. There is no action on it. So what the people observe is that we have these eight-year cycles with the promise of so much and the delivery of so little. So there's a lot of hope, there's a lot of expectation, and by the end of eight years, there's so much frustration. And they are feeling that they're, taken for, they're getting taken for granted. The public sector workers are given a 4% salary increment. And Politicians yeah. get very juicy packages. What is the reason for that? So the point that Nanajua, mommy, mommy, yes. is raising, is pertinent. For how long are we going to go with this promising the people, hyping up their hopes and expectations, and then dashing it? If we do not pay attention to it and address it now, there might well be an eruption. And I know that in the aftermath of this Fix the, March, Fix the Country, Country campaign, the president has talked about winning 2024. <laughs> it's so, like it's like for you, this is not is like is this not a priority? Yes. Your priority is the next election. So the priority is the next election, and for most people, that's what it is. And something has to give. And I'm hoping that with this series of actions that have been planned by by the team, hopefully, you know, it will make people pause to reflect. I would just say that I have to give the convener some credit mm -hmm. because I don't think that people just showed up like that this is a mass mobilization effort so i'm sure that they really went out of their way to talk to people so i just want to give them credit for that as well mommy um what are the low-hanging fruits for instance that can be quickly dealt with that gives a sense of one government actually demonstrating that they are listening mm -hmm. to the issues raised by uh, the, the the movement so realistically speaking, and I think I mentioned this before, because the problems are so systemic and um, you're looking at decades of issues, one of the key things would be to start appointing people who have skill, who can do the work. When I say appointing, it's... So it really must be a meritocracy. It yes. mustn't be a political patronage. No. So right now, what I'm saying that in but, this... But then that, I don't know if that's realistic. So political me... parties... <laughs> Political parties are entities, they come into office. Yes. Obviously, they won't appoint people outside their party. There are rare instances right. of professionals yes. who have made their mark and are brought in to support. But that's really... Because honestly, Babajiva, let me ask you, because the thing is this, if, because being a politician doesn't mean you have skill. And if you don't have people who have skill or gifted people to do the work, then it's a hopeless situation. That's what I, why I'm saying that, like, so for example, let's say Kagame, who brought in um, this Tiami guy from Senegal, who was with um, mm. Mm. Um, oh, IF. Oh, Tijon Tiam. Yes, and then, you know, he's not even Rwandese, but yes, he brought him uh, in. Yes, he's Ivorian. Yes. yes, and then seeing their real, like, the situation in the country and realizing that, you no, know, Kagame is always open to bringing people. Now, I'm not trying to make a comparison, but what I'm trying to say is that when you are dealing with a problem in your house, okay, imagine your fridge is broken. Now you're thinking, okay, I can't buy a new fridge, okay? And um, I need to get it fixed. What are you going to do? You're thinking of who can fix the fridge, yeah. right? If I was in, in, I was, uh, in the MPP or I was the president or whatever it is, I'll be thinking right now, like, look, the situation is bad. The people I have there 
right now. People are, because there are people who don't really know what they are doing. I'm just, and this is no offense to anybody in power. There are people now who are holding office who don't know the work. If I were them, I would even ask, find somebody in the meantime, because we have three years left with you unless something drastic happens. Find somebody. It's okay to not know. And that is it. We have this, um, we lack intellectual humility in this country. Honestly speaking, it's okay not to know and it's okay to say, you know what, we need help. And it's okay to be able to outsource that help and find people who can do the work. And at the end of the day, we have three years left. What is a drastic thing you can do right now? Let's say, for example, it was the energy sector. Find people with skill. This thing of finding friends and stuff, truth of the matter is we all want the same thing. And we can't, and it's like, if I, if I had three years left in power and I have a legacy to leave, and you're so desperate to come back into power, then you know what was the most drastic thing you do in three years? You're going to find people who can give you results in three years. What kind of results? The most tangible results, right? Maybe you're, you cannot necessarily build a bunch of hospitals all of a sudden, but what are the little things that you can do that will at least alleviate the so pressure? So that at least people, if it's, and if it's fixing NHIS so people can have good health care, that's a low-hanging fruit. Absolutely. If it's about um, jobs, ensure yes. that there are some sustainable yes. jobs, not NAPCO, yes. 700, 800 yes. CDs. Um, I mean, I, I guess th those are the areas you, for you that Absolutely. are important. Yes, exactly. So you're going to create jobs and you're going to find that maybe at the end of the day, it's like, okay, fine. Who you, I, if I could, I'll find somebody. I'll be like, hey, listen, within the next three months, I want you to help me come up with something to be able to solve this problem, ABC, right? And then come up with a plan. I'll, maybe I might not even announce it to anybody. Yeah. The person I outsource the help. Because sometimes you cannot outsource, you can outsource skill. Yeah. Get the person to give you the results you want. And then you begin to see, people will even begin to see change on the level, to some extent. To some extent. Yeah, that's what I, I would, I, I that, don't know, maybe I'm just you, off. You but like to look like, yeah, and, and <laughs> I must admit, it's interesting you mentioned Thijon Thiam. He yeah. was the um, CEO for Credit Suisse right. and had also been head of Prudential in the UK. Right. And, and that's the kind of person that, yeah, you would want to, to help you fix something. Yeah. Uh, Oliver, so two things I want to raise with you. Um, so the issue of social justice. Mm. I guess that was quite a fundamental pillar for this march. And uh, Kaka, who died in uh, Idra, um, which sparked the disturbances, his daughter spoke. To what extent are you confident that the element or the issue to address social justice is one that we can do? So let me make a quick point. I mean, I'm Oliver after all, and I'm asking for more. Uh, there's, something, there's something that the two of them said, and I must give a lot of credit to so many of the people we have been trying to, and organizing this with. Because even among ourselves, so many of them I met for the first time on the day, or persons who I've been speaking to consistently for the past three months. A lot of them I did not even know their names. And when I say their names, their real names, because one of the decisions we have taken was to protect people's identity. So it was really refreshing to meet so many people. But we also left no stone unturned. I've never met these two individuals ever in person, but I reached out to both of them to come for the event. So we, we made sure that we were reaching out to so many individuals and we took nobody for granted. And it was important for us to get that work done. And it's really impressive to me that so many of the core team who were doing this were persons who were younger than 25. And it's really refreshing for me to think of persons who are so committed to advancing the process. Now, to your question, one of the things we started from the very beginning was that the way towards reforming our system was to be able to create a sense of the beauty of dissent and that to make people feel confident in their voices and the ability to, to say no, to disagree. And, and this is why the Kakai issue has become very important to us. Because if we leave it to fester, it rolls back what we are trying to do. This idea that any time you speak up, any time you do something, Person, something can happen to you and nobody cares. Like what happened to Amit that there's never any answers when it matters. And this is why we've taken up that cause, that for us to be able to reform the system, citizens ought to feel confident enough to be able to engage that system without fear that any time you, you do anything than pray, sing for the regime, you're going to lose your life. Our democracy should be able to make space for dissent. And we saw that we saw the, disappoint the disappointing reality of when we tried to put up a billboard and within less than two days it was pulled down. And he said, if our democracy cannot even sustain or make room for a billboard, it is not fit for purpose. These are some of the questions we want to be able to have. But now, is it fair to blame uh, our democracy? There are always rogue elements. 
um, within groups and entities that may be over enthusiastic, they may be uh, exuberant, and no one has told them to pull down your billboard or pull down a billboard in opposition to a current administration. But they do it anyway because they are seeking to self protect and, and maintain a certain self interest in favor of someone. So, because there's a culture that creates a system whereby persons anticipate the needs of leadership and by doing so act undemocratically because they know that to act properly and constitutionally will end them repercussions from persons above. It's, it saves down. So that's what you see. For instance, in the particular case of the billboard, the person who owned it had received so many calls from persons affiliated to government to pull it down or she was going to lose her job with the AMA. This is the, these are the issues you're talking about. And the face of oppression has changed in the country, whether they target the nerve points of economic oppression. So many people who, people who have been uh, mobilizing with us have had their jobs threatened. They've had persons who were working from in offices of, in the office of the president, ministers' offices, who had called their employers directly. Persons who have received query letters just because they tweeted, face the country. So these are issues that has become the way in which the this democracy shields oppression and that's the kind of things we're talking about and trying to advance now even let's talk about the police for instance almost every time the police take an unconstitutional action the response is always order from above and a lot of times there may not in fact be an order from above but it's an, an anticipation of the needs of the above so if the above is a core group of persons who are not democratically inclined persons below them get the message it's the same thing that happened with Drumelovo, for instance. When he came out and said, beyond himself, all the individuals who had worked with him had either been demoted, sacked, or transferred. It sends down the message that anybody that dares try to do different and not play by the rules would have these repercussions. And I've seen this in the public service. I worked with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I've seen so many public servants, rather than do what is right, would choose to disengage because it is more protective of themselves. Why would they stick their neck out? If if the replications are so dire and nobody's going to stick up for them. This is what we are talking about, about the need to reform the culture of the country because, before we can deliver on those promises we are talking about. Um, Dr. Soji Tete, one of the things one would refer to is how difficult it is to actually achieve results. Mami Awenado mentioned a certain strategy. And in a sense, if you have three years to go, you have nothing to lose if you want to effect change. But you need people to be on board as well. So I'm just wondering, getting that balance, is that achievable? It's achievable. I mean, what I find interesting in this current conversation is the fact that we are talking about a government in the first year, only the first year of a, four of year a second term. term. And this is not a new administration. You know, so I would even have expected that in terms of continuity, we would have seen greater fluency. But up until this point, we do not have CEOs of agencies appointed. Well, they've been appointing them oh, well, in the last few days. Fact, this is August. <laughs> the <laughs> same <laughs> government has been in power since 2000 and what? 16? Yes, but it is 6,000. So Let's talk it, about, I mean, it's about appointing so 6,000 people. It's about... Uh, look, I mean, let's face it. Did been you a see? Hue, they, hold on, there'd been a hue and cry about government expenditures, the kind of wastefulness, and even in terms of the numbers of ministers, there was a certain attempt to cut it down. And in terms of even who got what, who got to, who got into parliament, who achieved what, certainly for a second term, if the president is trying to be strategic and he's taking his time to do that, maybe that's not a bad thing. No, I've always been very disappointed with the slow pace of appointments in our, in our public sector, and especially with our governments. And even more disappointed when we see transitions from one government to the same government. So you've seen the people, you know your vision. If you are going to appoint fewer people, that is even more cost for you to appoint in a shorter time. And the implications are not trivial. The fact that we do not have governing boards of state institutions, it's not trivial. I recently had an opportunity to engage with people at the Medical and Dental Council. Foreign doctors have written exams. They don't know whether they've passed or not passed because the results have been withheld. The reason the results have been withheld is because there's no board to approve the release of the results. And people are, you know, waiting. So when Mami talks about the need to appoint competent leaders, we have glaring opportunities and we, we do not make use of them. 
The second thing also is that in, apart from getting competent people, one needs to make fewer promises. Fewer promises? Yes, fewer promises. And focus on execution. What does it take to actually execute on the promises that have been made? We are in a country with all of these healthcare issues, and then we have massive infrastructure projects that have not been completed. And yet we see no effort on the part of the government to complete hospitals and other facilities that are lying in bushes fallow elsewhere. I don't know about no effort because I guess maybe the challenge is the challenge of resources. We know that uh, for our revenue, we spend what almost 80% of that service in our debt. We have just some 20% of that for capital uh, infrastructure and, and other things. So Jifa, tell me, which is easier to complete uncompleted hospitals or Let's to promise to build 88 new hospitals? 101. Uh, well, 111, I beg your pardon. There you go. There you go. So it's a question of prioritizing, allocating resources, finding effective personnel, and making sure that there's accountability, holding people responsible within specific timelines. I mean, these are the basic things that we are not seeing. Mami, I've heard other people say young people may be calling for these things, but young people also have a responsibility. Uh, they also have a responsibility to, uh, you know, acquire the skills, you know, work towards a certain vision and goal for themselves. They should not also see politics as the easy way. So if they are student leaders and then suddenly they see that the way to make it quick, fast and rich is to quickly get into politics. It's, it should be no surprise to us mm -hmm. that maybe we have a generation of leaders who may not have worked in a certain environment, may not have built up certain sets of skills, and they now have to do the kind of things you expect. And if we're not getting results, I don't know if we are to blame, the youth also are to blame. Okay, so pretty much it's like um, the youth taking responsibility? Is that pretty much Yes, I've heard people say that, um, yeah. I mean, like, let me be honest with you. Um, I had this conversation yesterday when we're watching the relay. The relay yes. of uh, 100, the, yes, the, Ghana, the Ghana, the 4 by 100. I didn't want us to talk. <laughs> no, actually, we're talking about the team. No, I'm just teasing. Oh, they're, they're talking about I'm it. just teasing because I just wanted to pass like a distant oh. memory. <laughs> so, you know, for me, I like to like, I was, I'm trying to like think deep into the whole thing. So when, I, when the thing was happening was over, I, was, I told my mother, I said, look, this just hit me. Even beyond running fast is the skill of passing the baton, right? Yeah. It's a strategy. Yeah. And also who starts, who finishes, who's in the middle. Mm. You see, generationally, like if you want the next generation to be better, how do you pass the baton? When you pass the baton, the manner in which you do it mm. helps to empower the next person to be able to move quick. And so once, sometimes, even if you look at the, the and I'm sorry I'm using the Olympics. Oh, that's okay. If you look at the Go track, ahead. right, even the lane you run in, you see, Africa and Ghana, and when I say Africa, because most of African countries, when you go to the, any other, they will tell you they're having the same problem. We are running a track whereby every generation is carrying the burden, not only of their generation, but the previous one. Because we are from a history of, um, a history of we come from a history of slavery, colonization, like new colonization, truthfully, because we don't own much, right? We just have the resources, we don't have money. People are controlling things. Anyway, that's a whole different discussion. And so at the end of the day, for the next generation to do better. The big question is that how are you passing on the baton? Are you holding on the, when you're supposed to run a relay, 4 by 100, are you trying to run a relay like a marathon where an older generation is keeping on to a baton longer than they're supposed to do? So the key thing is that, yes, can the next generation, should we take accountability for the fact that there is an entitled generation coming up? Yes, or people are looking for quick results. There's that element too. But the big thing is where's the mentorship? Where's the guidance? How are you preparing them? I'm only as good as the information I have. The home I'm coming from. What are you teaching your kids? If they come home, what are, you, what are, they, what are they watching? What kind of values are we passing down? And that is why I feel like our generation, in fact, has so much work. We are carrying the burdens of our parents. The thing that they couldn't do, their failures. And then we are now thinking of how to fix theirs. How to fix ours and make sure that our kids have better. And that is why it's for this generation to ask themselves that what legacy are you leaving? There's so much debt. And then you're asking yourself, what are you passing on? When we don't win the race, you're going to sit there and say they didn't run well. It's not because we didn't run well. When did you pass the baton on to us? How did you train us to run? And so I think this generation really... That's a huge burden. I see so many young people who've come to Ghana are struggling with their businesses, trying to give people opportunities. People are even like, when you get sick, 
I'm, I'm classified as a, you're supposed to even be part of the middle class. When you get sick, you pray first. Because <laughs> you want to tell, like, I have a friend now, she has a medical condition that is even very basic. But her pill, one drug is 140 CDs. How many people can afford, afford that? Afford that, yeah. So I'm asking myself, I really, yes, the generation, we want to take accountability and responsibility, but help us. I think one of the, the, the basic things to judge a country is maternal, you know, health care. Yes. And, and Soji, Dr. Tete knows all too well, right. you know, the kind of experience I've had and the kind of discussions we've had about what healthcare should be, right. and, and, which is really just the basic thing. So Oliver, um, looking ahead, next steps for the movement, because at the event, when you gathered at the, um, is it the Black Star Square? Yes. Um, one, one of the things that you did was you didn't, speak to the media. In fact, you asked the media to go. Why did you do that? I think the media have been quite supportive of the team. So it's almost as if you asked the media to step aside and you only wanted to speak to the people. I mean, I'm just trying to understand mm. what was the um, concept or thinking behind that in order to understand what the next steps are, because it's only the media that can convey your next steps. <laughs> so I think it's important to make one thing clear that in deciding that the media should take the backstage and for, for the people to come forward, it's not necessarily saying that we do not prioritize and value the media's presence there. But it also reflects something we've been saying consistently, which is that who the audience is. And the audience is the people who had come there and who had been there and that we wanted to engage. And she said something about the values that we are passing on and people and what kind of the ways in which we are educating people and raising consciousness. And a lot of times when we say this, people think that we're saying it to be provocative. But we genuinely mean that our audience and our conversation must be with the people. And that if you are trying to get people to understand their role and the value of their voice, you must make them feel that they are involved in a conversation. Not that you've put yourself in a position where you are projecting yourself on TV and making fine speeches to an audience that is not necessarily listening to you. And so that dynamic is what is important to us that we wanted to enforce there. But also going forward beyond that conversation. One of the things that we have done and we, we want to continue to do is that people are only as good as the information they have and what they understand about the process and what this is about. And we cannot achieve that if we come into a space whereby so many young people come and a lot of the times when even when you're speaking to them, they do not understand what you're trying to say to them. So let me give you an example. Uh, one, one of the conveners, Bashira Tokamau, bef so before she went on stage, uh, we had a whole conversation about what language she was going to speak. Mm -hmm. And we decided she was going to speak Hausa. Yeah. And when she finished speaking, a number of people came to her and said, this is the first time they've gone to a demonstration that they understood what was being said there. I, I do not express myself well. I, I always say that I'm not interview competent in, in any of the local languages. But I took three that day. And I used that opportunity because I understood that we're having a conversation with a different audience and that they do not want fine grammar and fine diction to be able to convey the message. You have to break it down in a different way for them to understand. And it was important to be able to do so and tie their concerns into the fundamental structure of this country, which is the Constitution. And that's what we, we did so beautifully that day. And that is the way in which it's going to define the way in which we continue to engage different people and have that conversation with them because we have to change mindsets. And that was very present as well in a demonstration of this size. When we went there, we got so many dust bin rubbers. What we said, we're thinking about engaging people to sweep after them. The young people took those from us and said, we're having a peaceful and clean demonstration. And we're cleaning up as we're moving from a brass spot right into the Independence Square. We have... We have so many images of when political parties have held events where they've let, they've let so much rubbish there at those events. It tells you that there's something different happening. But because we are so engaged in the process of mischief that we are refusing to see the rise in consciousness. But there's also a last point I want to make. Because a lot of times when we talk about this, we're talking about it as if this is only a youth-convened event. It goes beyond young people. It was interesting to see the, the elderly. And I said that, so the, the gentleman which was, was profiled, I met him here, actually. I spoke him at Onya TV, and he was in Tema, saw me on TV and came here to meet me wow. before I came out. And we had a conversation, and I told him that I think you should go to Independence Square directly. He said no, he insisted that he was going to start and walk as well. 
And so it was, I, I didn't really think he was going to do it. And to see him do that, it really made me pause. But it also made me pause on what I consider to be the failures of what a demonstration is. Because that's what we are doing now. Instead of critiquing the event, is that we did not make it, it in, in, in accessible enough to, for persons with disability. That we have to provide those frameworks. Because so many of them kick, came and did the adios work with them. We have to find ways in which we can engage and bring more of those people into so improve, like the improve the inclusivity of the movement of the event. and how how it's accessible Absolutely. to everyone. Absolutely. So these are the things that we are taking and looking at and when we are thinking about what the next one is going to look like and what the things we should prioritize. These are the conversations that we want persons in leadership to have. That after everything there's a post mortem. What they're asking themselves, did we deliver to the people and what could we do better? Mm. So often we don't feel that. Mm. Quickly, before I, I go back to uh, Dr. Tete and uh, Mesa Wenado, will there be other demonstrations in other parts of the country? Will it be replicated, let's say, on a regional basis, for instance? Certainly you may not be able to do all 16 regions, but maybe you, you want to do it in sectors or something like that. Our hope is to be able to do it in all 16 regions. That is the plan. Uh, but one of the things we are also very mindful of in, in doing this plan it also has to be very sensitive to public health concerns mm -hmm. as we are moving into the regions. And perhaps the way in which the decision may come would be to prioritize regions where they have low cases and that community transmission is at its lowest. And that might inform the order in which we go without any particular, uh, without particular choosing places based on, you know, lack of con congregation of people and things like that. That's the process we want to do. Because one of the, the reason why we are doing this uh, I've said consistently is that we didn't say we wanted to fix, fix Accra. This is what this is not about. This is about the country. And a lot of times we've prioritized the needs or the voices of Accra dwellers over so many parts of this country. We can only understand what these other people are saying. And a lot of them who are offline, we can only understand if we get into those communities and try to mobilize them and have the same conversation and opportunities for engagement that we have provided Accra. Mm. Mami, um, looking into the future, I mean, some young people may be part of this mm -hmm. movement currently, but there will be overtures to them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've heard a few people say, what do they want? Mm -hmm. And I, I find that quite odd because I think it's been clear mm -hmm. they want good jobs, they mm -hmm. want a sustainable way of life. They will. So knowing the economic hardship, mm -hmm. it's very easy to make overtures and break the ranks mm -hmm. of the movement. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things I, I wanted to, because, you know, having um, Rocky, is one of the key things is that fix the country is, I don't think it's, a one, it's, um, it's about one person or a specific group of people. We all want the same things. And I think because Ghana, we are very accustomed to, oh, okay, so like because of politics, right? People cannot think outside that. So it's either like you are NDC, you are MPP, or you are. And so one of the key things is that this, I think this whole thing is like, one is a movement. A movement is like, is, um, is beyond the people who are even in it, right? It's the idea that we all want the same things. And that's why even you can be asking what do they even want? They want what you want. So you can be MVP and you want fixed Ghana to be fixed. You can be NDC, you want Ghana to be fixed. One of the key things that people need to understand, and this is actually true, is that when it comes to religion and politics, people attach identity to ideas. So now the problem now is that people cannot divorce who they are from their part that they support. So once you even say, oh, fix the country now, then it, it, it sounds like MPP is bad, right? But that's not the thing. And if you don't take it and we don't break it down properly, people miss the point. The idea of politics will always change, or your party ideally will always change. But what will always remain the same is what we want for Ghana. We all want light. We all want access to good health care. So the question is that right now, Ghana's problem, the only reason why it's frustrating, people cannot understand what the people want is because they are looking at it as we are in power now. What they're asking for is that now it's against what the party in power is doing. That is wrong. What they are doing is that they are asking for something that everybody should be asking for no matter what. 2050, you should still be asking. It's like, it's like <laughs> these things they are asking for yes. should be a given. Absolutely. Should and we should given. all want that. that. And that is why the fundamentals, are, because believe me, if you divorce certain political things from opportunities and people, you see those allegiance. Mm -hmm. People are holding on 
to political ideology number one sometimes because of even like where they are from their hometown mm -hmm. or because of a the job family they... divorce all of that and you see where the allegiance is that is why when you make the national pledge you say i promise on my own to be what faithful and loyal to ghana that means that even if my part the party i don't like is in power party you don't like is in power i will still give my best because it's for ghana Right? Because I'll give an account. Whatever I'm sowing to this nation will speak years when I'm even dead and gone. And this is why they fix the country, even though there are people at the forefront as leaders and stuff, this is bigger than him. Because how many, he not, even if he lives up to 100, he will still live one day. This should be something that even 50 years down the line, we are always asking, Ghana should be fixed. Mm -hmm. So that even if you are an MPP and you wake up every day, that's why I have a problem now. Like I'm saying, we need to begin to find common ground and dialogue. Because when it comes to, nobody likes opposing views. It's very difficult because you feel like you're attacking your person. That's why when somebody even speaks about a problem, then you see people insult, stupid. And I'm like, ah, no, they're missing their point. So we should be able should to now find... My Facebook pages. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, we should, we should find common ground. Yeah. We should actually we should be able to sit with uh, MEP and DC, CEP and say, don't we all want the same thing? If Ghana is working, won't it benefit all oh, of us? Yeah. This is not about our coup fado. How long would all of these leaders live anyway? Most of them are even old. We will still be stuck with the same Ghana after. So let us begin to find common ground and ask, they want what you want. Mm -hmm. Now how can we all get the same, same thing? things? Yeah. Let's work together for that. Yeah. That's right. Uh, Dr. Tete, in terms of meeting the needs of young people, um, I mean, it's not often you get the finance minister speaking. And one nice Sunday, he, he gathered all of us and told us all the things uh, being done. He tried to explain to us the challenges uh, the country has faced in the last two years, particularly brought on by COVID. And then, of course, how we manage to service our debt. He gave the media review and indicated that they will be seeking to provide some one million jobs over the next two years. Uh, they're ensuring that there's some strong fiscal discipline to ensure that uh, you know we don't get out of gear because knowing fully well that in 2024 we have to uh, prosecute an election that is even the year we spend so much um, should young people be hopeful unfortunately we don't have a plan per se of what where the jobs are coming from what sectors what the target is and the like all we were told is part of it is focused on entrepreneurship but then um, any hopes I, I believe young people should be hopeful but not because of what the finance minister said. <laughs> <laughs> because of what I saw on the demonstration day. You know, it's a beautiful thing to see people who have their sense of agency activated. So this was a, a march that was happening in a COVID era. Mm -hmm. And it was beautiful to see people going out, handing out face masks. People would go and tell fellow demonstrators that you need to wear the mask. That, that, that was wonderful. And then also, I think Oliver has spoken about those who were just cleaning the place. They knew what the right thing was. They knew it may represent some inconvenience to themselves. Someone told me that I need to clean it so that they understand the message that we are trying to, to preach. Um, so this is really where the hope is, that individuals know that they have the ability to be able to take control of their own circumstances and then act on it. I think that we should not stop on the track of holding the leadership accountable, whatever the, the, the point is. Because if we do not hold them, thankfully the president says that we should be citizens and not spectators. So that really should be the mantra where we hold them accountable. A lot of the time, I think our politicians have gotten into the space where they can make all the declarations they made to you, but there's no follow up. There's no accountability. Even if they don't do it, what happens? You know, so we need to not get tired. We need to stay engaged, and we need to hold them to the promises at all times. If you ask me whether when I went for the demonstration, I was demonstrating against the MPP, I would say no. I, was, I did not go to demonstrate against the MPP. We have a system that is not delivering the outcomes it promised. And so we all need to take a hard and honest look at it. In fact, the demonstrators slammed all of the political leaders since 1992. The only person who got any praise was President Nkrumah. So it just tells you clearly the focus. And I think that we should divorce it from some of these our partisan sentiments and put the nation first to be able to get the results that we are looking for. All right. And it's still the key points here on TV3 and 3FM. And you can continue to join the conversation. Our hashtag is hashtag the key points. You can also send your WhatsApp messages to 055 369 
0809-2489. And you can also follow us on our Facebook page. Just look for uh, TV3 Ghana and 3FM 92.7 on Facebook. And you can continue to follow us there as well. We are also live online at 3news.com. Send your thoughts through. We'll take a quick break and we'll be right back taking uh, final comments from our panel. You're welcome back. It's hashtag the key points. My name is Jifa Bampo. This program is live on TV3. It's also live on 3FM 92.7. You can check out our Facebook page and follow us there. Just search for uh, TV3 underscore Ghana. Also search for 3FM 92.7. And also join us online at 3news.com. And I've had in the studio with me so far, uh, Oliver Bakavoma. He's the convener for the Fix the Country movement. And then we have have uh, Mami Awenado. She's a consultant with Black Bridge Consulting, focusing a lot on trade, local and international. And Dr. Soji Soji Tete, he is the council chair for the Center for Social Justice. He's also a former vice president of the Ghana Medical Association. So, uh, Mr. Vomawo, in terms of sustainability for the movement, one of the key concerns I know that exists among people who follow uh, the narrative is that, oh, very soon uh, people will be parachuted out, they'll be given juicy incentives, and the movement will be left destitute. Is that a fear? I know Mami has said this is bigger than just uh, partisan ideology or partisan interest, but when people's stomachs are mm -hmm. empty, anything can, can get them out. I think those concerns uh, affect people's you know, caginess and cynicism around this must be respected because it is there, it repeats itself so much in our, in our politics that a lot of times people disengage from genuine projects or project that could lead to something bigger than that. And the reason why a lot of political parties see that it work, do this because they've seen it work so many times. And it's, it comes from the fact that our politics lacks ideas and definitely does not want to reform itself. That it must do everything to co-opt voices and bring them into the status quo to maintain the status quo. And we have made a commitment. A lot of the persons who are involved in this have made a commitment to do different. In fact, on the day of the protest, uh, a lot of us involved there publicly took a pledge that we were not going to engage or take any money or do anything with any of the, uh, main any of the political parties. But I want to make this point clearly. A lot of the things we're saying is that fix the country is not going to become a political party of its own. That's not what we're thinking about. I am not looking to project myself into political leadership. I am an academic at heart. I love my job teaching, and that's what I want to do. But I think the most important thing I want to address is that because we are waking so many young people up, and so many people have become interested in the process, if, so, if everybody else tells me that, well, we only have two parties anyway, NDC and MPP, then it means that we are calling for reforms of those parties themselves. And so if young people who are coming up decide that, we want to get into those spaces and reform the culture within those spaces and encourage them to do so. They are entitled to participate in a democratic process and to improve the substance of it. But I think now the core messaging is that the parties have been around for a long time. We've had this shuffle for 30 years. We can sustain this a bit more than one demonstration in just three months. And we feel that things have changed dynamically. No. The, the broken system is a billion dollar industry. There's so many invested interests in keeping it broken. And if we do not have that mindset, we cannot reform that system. So that's a commitment we must make and watch for. Now about sustainability and how we move this forward. You know, going this forward, and so you was reminded me, reminded me of when I'd put up a post saying that even if we have 15 people who show up, we're still going to do that because that's what is most important. And we went in there and so many times when you're doing this, it feels like you're speaking into the wind and that there's nobody who is listening. Fourth August brought that myth. And I'm hoping that as we continue to have this energy to do that, as we bring different people into the process, I've had conversations with so many young, even in places we haven't gone to, in the north, Activista, and so many different community networks that we are activating, we are hoping that they come onto the process and take this and own it. And it's only through having local community networks and young people and old people associations take this project on, can it depersonalize it, as we've been talking about, and send that message going forward. That's that is the best way we can anticipate creating a framework for sustainability. 
Thank you. And let me just take some messages before I come back to Dr. Tete and to Mami Awenado. This one says, it's true, the 1992 constitution should be the first casualty of the fix the country agitation if we really want the country to be developed. But the constitution does not fix potholes. Neither does the constitution address health and working condition issues. The country can't be fixed when money meant for development projects always ends up in the hands of uh, corrupt politicians and their cronies. That's from Abladi Takradi. This one says, I disagree with the health minister. He should be sanctioned accordingly. But why? Where were the hashtag fix the country demonstration when John Dramani Mahama was in office? So this tells us that they are all NDC, including the pastor who spoke. So they should wait and see. This one from Abu. This one says, good morning to you and your panel. There's a lot to be fixed in this country. There had been a change of curriculum in the basic schools for over two years now, and there is no single textbook provided. Yet government was able to procure past questions for SHS students, yet they tell teachers not to speak to any media. All is not well in this country. Hashtag fix the country. This Fred from Winchi in the Bono Half region. Philip from Accra says, we the youth of Ghana need a change in our constitution. Our leaders are not helping us. And uh, finally, it says, uh, Chris, this is from Christian in Takradi. You guys are really on point enjoying your show. Thank you very much for all your text messages. And feel free to send more on 055-369-8789. So I guess this comes to the final bit of, of the questions as we get ready to wrap up. One of the demands is a new constitution. And there was a specificity to that. Expunge the Article 71, which... I mean, the last time I did a count, it's not just politicians, you know. I mean, these are some senior public servants and, and all that. And they come up to what? Some 600 people, you know, sitting under Article 71. I'm just wondering, Soji, we've had a constitution that has run for 30 years. It serves us well in some purposes. It's given us a certain stability that we lacked for close to, what, 20 years uh, or 30 years from the 1960s. Is it realistic to ask for a new constitution? And really, will politicians deliver it, knowing that they are, and some senior public servants, they are the key beneficiaries of this current constitution? Yeah, I think it's, it's a realistic call. And in many of the democracies, they would tell you that the constitutions are living documents. So we are not supposed, we, we, it's supposed to serve a purpose. And when that purpose is not being met, it's okay to reflect and to ask ourselves which aspects that we can, you can, we can reform. And you recall that President Mills put together a constitutional review committee that came up with an elaborate report. Government issued a white paper, and that was, that was it. A lot of the things were, were not accepted. Yeah. yeah. So, and in, uh, the American constitution has been reviewed. The British have had an opportunity to reflect on certain specific provisions. So these are dynamic you know, documents, and there's, there's nothing wrong with, with looking at it. You talk about Article 71. I mean, these are all people working in the public service. And yet, whenever we've come up with either a health sector salary structure or a single spine salary structure, we see that it doesn't apply equally across. From a social justice perspective, we are asking, why shouldn't we have the same spine for everybody? You know, the justification, this is why people talk about the fact that people are going into politics motivated not by the transformation they can bring, but because it's become a pathway to personal wealth. I think that we can look at that. There are issues around seeing parliament as a stepping stone to the executive, and thereby weakening parliament's ability to hold the executive accountable. So perhaps we could be looking at a complete separation of powers so that the accountability mechanisms will be strengthened. Or reduce the percentage. Or reduce the, the percentage. Because the percentage talks up. I think a lot of the time we say the percentage says the majority of ministers come from parliament. Mm -hmm. uh, Oliver, you were on the Constitution Review uh, Commission. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's not less than 50% of ministers. Mm -hmm. So it means that you can actually keep the number of appointees from mm. parliament much lower mm. than what it looks like a majority of maybe 70 mm. or 80 mm. percent. Yeah, you're absolutely spot on. I think even the problem goes a little beyond ministers because now there's really no separation between parliament and executive. Mm. <laughs> Why? Because you have members of parliament now who have been appointed to boards who are now MDs. Mm. It mm. doesn't sit with the constitutional ethic because they have now become part of part and parcel of the executive. Oh, executive yeah. and that's not what the constitution ever intended. It was supposed to cure just one mischief. And now we've used it as a license to blow apart parliament. 
Now, the leader, the leader of the majority in parliament is also the minister for, for parliamentary affairs. So, there's sort of... He, the, the, the criss-cross one one. Criss is a bit too much now. There's, there's really no... And so, I always say that this constitution put up a framework within which parliament was set up to fail. And, and, and that intention was already evident even in, in when the documents were being framed. Because the, the poison pill of that majority ministers comes from the 1979 experience, mm -hmm. when for the first time ever in this republic, parliament says no to a government budget presented by Professor Bene. And we say that, no, that means there's something wrong. So I think there's an ethic or, where we or don't the even fact think that so. the Volta region at that time had no member uh, of parliament, and so that person could not be, um, they could not appoint Point. a, a minister, minister from, the, from, from the region. So that was also... Uh, an issue. Mami, eh, someone sent us a text message. The constitution doesn't give jobs, doesn't pay bills, it doesn't solve your health care problems. Is it a new constitution or it is the actors who must implement what is in the document properly? Well, we see like um, the, the written word or the, what is on paper has to be reformed, right? I was even looking at Article 70, right, and the powers of the president to appoint, you know, and all of those things where it's like, the reformation is required because you see you don't want to put too much power on human beings because human beings are fickle all of us as human beings we even today how you feel today will be different of how, like you will feel differently tomorrow right and so the whole idea of reforming the constitution is that it's the constitution that drives the kind of people who sit and determine certain things right at the same time it doesn't necessarily change who the people are that's what the value system is necessary like important that we actually have a value system but the constitution helps to be able to like create proper structure of how things are run in the state and so reformation yes it won't build schools but it can determine it can help reduce the level of you begin to even see those who really have um genuine interest in really like helping to govern the state or people are going there because of business because see we are all we are selfish as people trust me everybody has in fact you won't even know how selfish you are until you are placed in a position where the, the, you are given the chance to be selfish that is why i can i'm very careful about even wanting saying hey i want to, you know you say oh when i'm in power i will never do this and you know what happens sometimes you'll be at home and you see something that is not for you, and then maybe you don't want to ask, and maybe you take more than you're supposed to take. You're like, oh, maybe I'll never do that if I had. See, the small things that we do will always play out in the big space. So what we are seeing happening on the big space, eh? it's a human trait. So the system must be able to regulate human weaknesses because everybody is fallible. Said so he who, that, who is without sin. Nobody is perfect. That is why you need a constitution that helps to manage the weakness of man because man is weak. And if you read things like about gold, the human beings are, can be very depraved. Trust me, it was when it comes to survival. When people see and they're hungry, forget it. So that is why we need to have a constitution and a system that helps to regulate even our weaknesses. Lest you even think that you're not making a mistake, but you are. And that is why constitutional reform is so important. We shouldn't see it as, you shouldn't desire too much power. Because that power will destroy you. It's nice in the beginning when you're controlling it, but you don't even know when you are slipping. And what is, what, what is life that you die and don't leave a proper legacy? And that is why I'm saying that in Ghana we have, we even, you know what, what we call murder. I know Ghana we like to say, oh, which is not deep, what break, break. But trust me, there's nothing more powerful than the kind of evil you see is when they ask you to do the road and you didn't do it well. And hundreds of people come and die. You're not a murderer because you didn't pull a gun. But your action caused the death of people. That is where we must come to with our conscience. We call the conscious leaders that we realize that your one decision, Baka, will affect me. Everybody, our everyday decision, you, as a mother, if you wake up and you make one wrong decision, your child can come and pay some price they didn't even have to pay for. But because you made a little decision. So that is why we need a constitution that helps to manage the weaknesses of human beings, because we're all fallible. Mm -hmm. And when we do that, we can have proper, that's why we do need constitutional reform. It's in right. our best interest. Well, let's so. see if, let's see if uh, the powers that be will, will pick up <laughs> on that. And uh, we've been uh, discussing the fix the country demonstration. What next? What are those quick issues, low hanging fruits that government uh, can address quickly? And what is the sustain sustainability path? for the Fix the Country movement. My guests have been uh, Oliver Bakavomawa, convener for the Fix the Country movement. He's a private legal practitioner as well as a legal academic. Mami Awinado, consultant with Black Bridge Consulting, focusing a lot on local and international trade. And then Dr. Soji Soji Tete, council chair 
for the Center for Social Justice. Let me just take uh, some quick messages that have come from all of you. This one uh, reads, um, they allow them to do a demonstration they allow them to do a demonstration about fix the country. How can we use the money to buy V8 for MPs whilst we have schools under trees? Uh, that's from Maxwell, Dunkwa Finn. It wasn't very clear though, but it, this one from Kunto in Kumasi reads, the so-called jobs they are promising will be given to party loyalists so that they can win the next election. The problem of the Ghanaian youth is political discrimination. I think he's referring to the one million mm. uh, jobs that the finance sure. minister says they're hoping to create over the next two years. This one from Lambert at Okuse says, congratulations to Mr. Vormawa for leading the Fix the Country. It's now time to turn attention to Akuse, our motherland, to fix Akuse, the road leading to the Akuse Hospital, which is one of the oldest hospitals in Ghana, which serves five municipalities, is a recipe for disaster. And Musa Abatwa and Kumasi writes, Jifa, anyone who underrates the effect of fix the, country, fix the Ghana demonstration doesn't understand the current political dynamics. Fix Ghana is not a political group, but a movement that wants better for the country. I totally support the activities and wish they could do the demonstration across all the 16 regions of Ghana. So that's been uh, the first part of our discussion on the key points. My name is Jifa Bampo. We'll take a quick break and we'll be right back with our next topic because it's been 29 years of the N. P P. I know it's not the usual 25, 30 years where you want to talk about a milestone, but 29 years for a political party that started really or rose from the embers of the ashes together with other parties like the DPP, the Egle party. The question you ask is, where are they all now? We now have two dominant parties, the NPP and the NDC. We'll be having that discussion when we come back. Stay with us. You're welcome back to Hashtag The Key Points Live on TV3 and 3FM. My name is Jifa Bampu. So almost 30 years ago, uh, multi-party democracy birthed the Democratic People's Party, the DPP, uh, the Egler Party, every Ghanaian living everywhere, the PNC, the People's National Convention, uh, the NDC, the National, well, the National Democratic Congress came much later though, in uh, 1996, the NPP, the New Patriotic Party, it also rebirthed the CPP also later and almost three decades down the line the NPP together with the NDC are Ghana's most dominant parties emerging the most successful both in and out of government and opposition because they've been able to sustain themselves uh, during those periods and of all these parties that I listed they are the only ones who've seemed to do that quite well but the NPP over the week, um, over the week marked 29 years of uh, party. Have they met the aspirations of Ghanaians? Their uh, slogan is development in freedom. Have they met our aspirations, our democracy? What is the path to inclusion for the next generation of young people? Our panel are uh, Yao Bwabing Asamwa. He is a director of communications for the NPP. He's a private legal practitioner as well, uh, Felix Kwachi Fusu, who is a former deputy communications minister under the NDC administration, Dr. Seydou Alidu, who is a senior lecturer with the Department of Political Science. And I want to welcome you gentlemen uh, to my first show, The Key Points. Um, much appreciated for coming in. But first, let me start off by taking some preliminary comments on the outcome of the Sputnik V vaccine probe, where we it has emerged that we've paid some 11 million, uh, sorry, 16 million Ghana cities to a third-party contractor, Sheikh Maktoub, and the minister had indicated under oath that no payment had been made. Certainly, um, not good news coming up. I'll start with you, uh, Mr. Kwachi Fosu. Should the minister tender in his resignation? Well, thanks, Jifa, and congratulations on the question of your first show. Thank you. Uh, let me also 
I extend some warm greetings to my folks at the Abra Sebukwam and Kese constituency. I hope to join them shortly after this program for a number of engagements. Um, you have quite a, a large viewership base there, and uh, they've indicated you know on certain terms that I need to acknowledge <laughs> their viewership. Uh, if I see, I am not surprised by the outcome of this investigation because I quite frankly think that the investigation was not required and that there, were, there was sufficient evidence even before the investigation began for President Akufadu to have taken action against his health minister. But unfortunately, we have a president who does not appear to be bothered in the least <laughs> about the misuse and uh, embezzlement and misapplication of the public purse. Oh, and, so, and so we we'll do absolutely nothing. <laughs> embezzlement? Absolutely nothing <laughs> about it. He will not hold any member of his government to account <laughs> to the extent that that person remains a member of his party. And so we have to go through the circuitous route of a probe by parliament. Now, fortunately, this probe was held in the full glare of the Ghanaian public. So we all heard what transpired. So even before the report was written, we were quite familiar with what the issues were. But we didn't know that 16 million. Yes, had I mean, been those, those, those who knew knew. Indeed, indications had been put out there that that had happened. In fact, the finance minister is on record to have granted an interview to the Norwegian outlet, VG, that first broke the story, <laughs> that he paid some money. So it was not uh, a new information uh, in the straightest sense of the word. Of course, you could argue that many were hearing it for the first time yesterday. But the point must be made that whereas the findings are not surprising, <laughs> it is an inaction, unwillingness on the part of the president to move to protect the public purse and sanction offending officials of his government. <laughs> that, is a, that is a difficulty. Because there are about four different violations in this instance. The first one is Article 1815, which makes it clear that if you are engaged in any international business transaction, you need to go to Parliament for approval. Now, the minister says because we were in an emergency and COVID was breathing down his neck and all that, he couldn't do so. See, it is not excusable. Because of who the minister is. The minister, if I'm not mistaken, and Mr. Boabin can correct me if I'm wrong, it's at least a three or four term MP. I'll yeah. correct you if you withdraw embezzlement. Because there's been <laughs> no, no, I'll explain. I'll explain. Oh, no, no. I, I will, it's, it's not. Why? <laughs> why? There's multiple, <laughs> there's multiple evidence of that. So I, I'm surprised that Mr. Okay, Boabin but you were mentioning, yeah. so just quickly mention exactly. the four violations. Exactly. You mentioned violating but the rules regarding international of transactions. We also violated sections 40 and 41 of Act 663, the Public Procurement Act. Mm -hmm. Then, it is obvious, based on his denials before the committee, that he lied on oath when he said that no money had been paid. And then... Not seeking cabinet approval. Finally, not seeking cabinet approval. Because it is, it is unimaginable that for something of this scale, the Minister of Health would, on his own volition, without recourse to Parliament, without recourse to the President, make any efforts to purchase these, uh, what do you call it, vaccines, when the president had been the driving force behind it in the first place. It was the president who first announced that we were going to purchase vaccines. No. So these violations call for the strictest sanctions. And because of the precedence that we've had in this country, it is completely mind-boggling that the president does not appear to be interested at all in sanctioning the, the health minister, especially because this same president has been quick to drag his political opponents to court over more frivolous matters. Look, Article 1815, for many people who do not know, is the reason why there was even an issue with the OYOME payment. It is because of Article 185. The Supreme Court ruled that because of that violation, the money should be refunded. Otherwise, Mr. OYOME would have worked free for no known violation. Okay, so now, when you come to the PPA violation, the reason why the Electoral Commission chairperson, Mrs. Charlotte, said was removed was because of procurement breaches. Indeed, there are about three or four different former government officials standing trial because of procurement violations. In fact, in fact had those to resign because in, of absolutely, the Absolutely. Indeed, binding. indeed. The NCA officials who went to jail, part of the reason was alleged procurement okay, violations. Okay, so I, I think you made so, a but he didn't embezzle the money. Well, I have not said, I have not, you said I have he, not spoken he, about embezzlement in this particular instance. I'm speaking in general terms about there's, there's multiple evidence okay, of embezzlement. Okay, so let me bring in uh, yeah. uh, Mr. <coughs> Boabing Asamwa because certainly it's always fair that the president wants to stand by his men. But for these violations mentioned in the report, certainly maybe time is running out for the health minister. Thank you very much, Jifa. I 
I'm very happy that you've had him withdraw the allegation of embezzlement. I mean, that is extremely serious. It's a proven criminal situation, which is not the case here. No such thing has happened. And uh, he just lost an election seven months ago. So the greetings to his constituency, you should slow down a bit. Oh, wow. In two years, you can't start. <laughs> In two years, you can't start. <laughs> <laughs> but then, I see two things that have happened. One, that Article 1815 has been established by the committee as having been breached, and that public procurement rules in terms of sole sourcing. But then the committee also said that the post ratification process was taking place. It had been submitted to PPP. Now, in all of this, you have a very experienced minister. Mamenu is a very, very experienced politician, minister, MP minister, was an MP in opposition as well. He's a chartered accountant, yes. from what I so, understand. So, 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 for the benefit of the doubt, he says he relied on two legs. Leg one being that he believed he was within his rights, uh, looking at the situation and the governing rules now on the restriction of impositions. And that the second leg was that he stood on the verge of saving lives or losing lives. And it wasn't an easy time mentally for him. And so the processes required, the normal processes required, we are not in a normal period. Uh, we are all aware of our new normal. And that within that context, human as he is, experienced as he is, Hmm? Even he, experienced as he is, was under that kind of pressure where he needed to procure vaccines to save lives. People were dying and, and vaccines were becoming difficult to acquire. And therefore, he believed that given the frame of the period, working within the Imposition of Restrictions Act, which gives you some leeway to operate in a sense, he thought he was doing the right thing and that he always believed he could go back to Parliament and have it ratified. For me, for me, it's not running away about the president and embezzlement and all that. I think it's a very constructive report. It's about drilling down probably to 185, 1815 and determine that perhaps this is the time to really, really legislate it by an act of parliament. So we set out the parameters clearly. Because I've been thinking, I, I saw the report last night. Suppose he had gone for emergency ratification in Parliament. I have been there before. They would have overturned the rules and done everything in probably less than two, three hours, mm. which means he comes in by certificate of urgency. It is read. It is, uh, it is passed through the three readings at once, and then it's approved. So after approval, and these things turn up later, all the uh, uh, issues in there with price and etc. turn up later. Is it Parliament's liability or is it his liability? But at least the leadership of the House who represent the people would know. Yes, and, that's and, what I'm and, saying. And then at least we all know the intent yes, behind it. Exactly. There will be no perception of whether this was an opportunity for a create, loot and share. Because there are three different entities in relation to this Patnik V contract. Yeah, there's the Sheikh Maktoub, there's the Ghana entity Ifa. that was, and then a third one. If I landed, it would have been easier. Because why well, now we now presuming that there was intent? No, I'm not saying there is. There is. I'm not so, saying so. So, so if you that's rushed to Parliament, there least... will be no intent. Why can't we give him the benefit of the doubt that there was intent to also save lives? That's why he rushed. Okay, sure. Yes, there was intent to save lives. That's why until we establish culpability for any uh, underhand dealings or whether that was a driving motive. We can't presume No, that. not on specifically his part, yes. but he could have been uh, hoodwinked by people seeking to create a scheme um, with a wrong impression that they can procure when they couldn't. Now we have paid this so, money. So, so, Mr. Kwashi Fosu said it's, it's not new, but I guess many of us would have hinged on the, the minister's word that no payment had been done. It was a document presented at the media budget review by the finance minister 
or page 101 or so, Appendix 4E, that indicated that payment had yeah, been the done. Ministry, the ministry has actually written, uh, saying that at the time the minister spoke, he wasn't aware. And again, I think he should be given the benefit of the doubt, because they have attached all the documentation after. All the documentation has been mobilized and has been attached and demonstrated there. And they stated clearly that the minister at the time he was giving evidence on this matter was not aware that the payment had been made. Okay, that's so, fair so point. But, but how then do you respond to mm. people who talk about a lack of fairness where certain ministers or public officials are removed from their positions, are prosecuted because they engage in these violations? This Yet a, this, the health minister is trying to pursue this is nine emotion. lives. This is emotion. Parliament on its own volition has set up an ad hoc committee. The report is going to be laid on the floor of the House. There will be a debate, both sides. And happily... This parliament is now uh, literally a <laughs> hung parliament. You have 137 facing 138, and the speaker uh, uh, on the other side. So, so I am sure whatever goes on on the floor of the house will demonstrate these other matters that we are raising here. But we can't begin to compare processes otherwise without looking at clearly the individual circumstances. So I believe that, first of all, the process of the committee reviewing it. It's positive for our democracy. I believe that. Secondly, I believe that the minister should be given the benefit of the doubt to the extent that he had, they, there's no malficience or, or deliberate intent established on his part to do something untoward. His explanation may not be acceptable to you, but he is within his rights to provide that explanation in the context of the situation that we have. But yes, Experienced as he is, chartered accountant as he is, uh, he's run that ministry for four years. He's in his fifth year. And he's confronted by a pandemic uh, of a seriousness that we haven't seen in over 76 years. Uh, since the Second World War, literally. We haven't seen anything of this magnitude impacting the entire world. And he is at the center of it as a minister of health. And then he's operating on a, a literally hour by hour basis and he has to save lives people are dying he's getting reports people are dying and so there's an opportunity to acquire vaccines vaccines are hard to come by and he takes decisions at the time he was taking those decisions are we saying he sat down to look at personal interest before he took those decisions and eliminated public interest in the sense of going through the procedures he's saying no i was under so much stress and I believed that I was within my rights in doing what I was doing because I have been fighting this. So, so now that it's been exposed that, well, he had to have gone to Parliament, well, he had to have gone to the procurement, uh, uh, public procurement authority, he ought to have uh, consulted more than he did. And he says, well, unfortunately, I was under so much pressure, I didn't. Okay. We have a report now. It is for the Parliament, we set up the committee to debate it on the floor, for the president to listen to them and for the public to make their judgments. Okay, but I'll I'll I am saying, my concluding uh, mm -hmm. position on it, I am saying that let us not ascribe malfeasance to him at this time. We can't assume that his intent was to do the country. If we do that, we are not being fair to him. Okay. Let me come to uh, Dr. Uh, Ali Du. There are governance issues uh, that are emerging in reference to this. For some, I've heard some people say it's instructive that in the report, in spite of all that was put there, Parliament didn't make any recommendations specifically on his conduct, whether he should continue in the role or the like. Is that something that, for instance, Parliament should be looking at, or based on the, the examples that Mr. Boabi Asamoah has raised, we should look on the face of it, why he did this, and his, uh, ex his, his position was that he was seeking to prevent any more deaths from the second uh, COVID wave. Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Zufa. I think uh, I want to approach this issue on three different levels. One, the context. Two, the setting. And three, the level of experience of the minister. Let's look at the context. I agree with Honorable uh, Babina Samoa that we are facing an unprecedented uh, health crisis, which has happened like for several number of years. We've never faced this kind of crisis. So, in a situation like this where vaccines are critical and in short supply at the market, every government will want to do everything possible to prevent deaths 
and to mitigate the sufferings of the people. So the context is, is quite dire. But the setting, we don't live in a jungle, we live in a democracy. And democracy prescribes institutions and procedure of doing everything. There are institutions, there are set laws, there are regulations governing how things should be done in, in this manner. And the processes under which it should be done. Even though we, we are facing an unprecedented health crisis, when the president wanted to fight this, he had to go to parliament and seek what? The restriction of movement. In position of in position, Act, yes. Even the president would have just said, oh, we are facing crisis, people shouldn't come out. But he thought that we are in a democracy and I need to use the right procedure and the right mechanism to fight the crisis. And I think the minister shouldn't have lost sight of the fact that regardless of the circumstances, we are still in a democracy and the appropriate procedure and rules must be applied. My third has to do with the experience. This is not the first time minister. He has been in that, he has been a minister. I think not, this is not the first minister he's heading. He's a very experienced legislature. And he has even been a chairman of the Public Accounts Committee. Yeah, when yeah. issues of this kind, procurement breaches, and he presided over them. And in most cases, they actually have to take on assemblies and uh, public government officials who have bring these processes. So I, I don't think knowing all this and given the experience that he has, he should have acted the way that he acted. Parliament, I, I, I'm not, I don't understand why maybe they didn't want to prescribe uh, uh, punishment or the way forward. But I think sometimes people may decide to use their conscience based on the circumstances and then and then make a decision. To be honest with you, I think he was doing this in the interest of what? The context, what we are facing, unprecedented challenges. But that shouldn't have given him the assumption that I can do this without who calls to law. Because at the end of the day, they will apply the law to you, if you, if you, if you, no matter how you try to, to save the, the, the people. So I, to, based on me, I think, sorry, from my perspective, I think the minister should do something, maybe in a yeah. dignified manner, All right. based uh, on the circumstances. Yeah, Mr. Kwachi, for sure. uh, your thoughts, because it's two things. Mr. Boabing and somewhere, and I, and I think that's a fair point, he has not embezzled any money. That was not referred to well, in the report. However, yes, the issue of his conduct is a, a, a matter. But the M, it's instructive that the MPs didn't prescribe well, any punishment I, first of all, for I'm him. Not, I'm not sure why Mr. Asamoah is uh, basically jubilating oh. over the fact that I have said but that I use embezzlement generally to describe a certain consistent pattern of behavior under the Akufado government. I was not specifically referring to this matter. So but I spoke but, all but, but we, we have people. Well, I go, no, <laughs> let me make the point. Let me make the point. Let me make the point. I could cite, <laughs> yes, I could cite so many. Listen, I could so cite so many. We don't want to just generalize it so many. across Why? the board. The movie pinna matter is a clear case of him. The, 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 the cash for seats matter. The, what they call it? Uh, Even the PDS matter. Uh, there are so many of them that I could cite. Uh, but on this particular issue, you see, I don't know why Mr. Samuel again will want to make excuses for the minister. Look, what I am gleaning from all of this, and when you relate it to other things they've done under COVID, is that COVID has become an artifice. That is veiling an intent, you know, to abuse the public purse for personal profit. The minister is not only very experienced. Indeed, he was deputy finance minister under President Kufo. This is some almost 16 years ago. He's been a three-term MP, if I'm not mistaken. So he's no spring chicken. He's still a member of He's no spring chicken. He, and Mr. Uh, Dr. Sedu made a point that he had chaired Parliament's Accounts Committee before which similar instances had come and he had judged you know, he has sat in judgment of others who allegedly broke the procurement laws. Again, the institution that he is part of, Parliament, has adequate mechanisms to take care of emergency situations. Mr. Wabia Samoa said that they could do this within three hours. Now, I'm asking myself, what exceptional difference would those three hours have made in terms of the speed and dispatch that was required to address the emergency that we had with COVID? It would not have made a dent in the effort to go and procure what do you call it? Vaccines but, but, to ensure that we save lives. Yeah, but so, then if we are faced with this situation mm -hmm. after the emergency no, process, no. who takes responsibility? No, 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 listen, listen. The further point I'm making is this, that Parliament itself acknowledges that there could be emergency situations. Indeed, in matters that do not bear any semblance to emergencies, certificates of emergencies have been issued to pass laws and legislation. So in an emergency situation, that the you need that... And that's the more reason why you need to use the emergency process that Parliament itself has. Even the Public Recruitment Authority has room for emergency procurement. And he could have reached them to ensure that the right things were done. Now, the reason why these laws exist is to prevent exactly what has happened. 
that public officials do not take advantage of situations like this to engage in wrongdoing and acts that are detrimental to the interests of the people of Ghana. So the excuses that are being made are not tenable. They are not acceptable. The minister knows far too much to have engaged in these fundamental and rudimentary breaches that are not acceptable. Are you Again, confident that we will retrieve the money? This well, is a we are going to have to retrieve. Is, is well, we are going to have to retrieve. Of course, to money. we are going to have to retrieve because legal processes would have to be kicked, kicked uh, started in order to ensure that. But the point that one needs to make is that this was completely avoidable. Again, the claim that Mr. Samoa makes and the minister makes that he was unaware that 60 million Ghana cities had been paid to this shake is also shocking. It is mind boggling. Well, the, 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 it is he not possible. Listen, the finance listen, minister it is, has made that it is not possible. Available. It is not possible. He, look, and indeed, how did the finance minister pay? The payment emanated from the Ministry of Health. They wrote to the finance minister that they had engaged in this and that this had to happen. There was no way that the finance minister would have paid without recourse to the health minister. What kind of ministry is Mr. Ajimamenu running that such huge sums of money can be paid in their name? And he will be unaware. Indeed, if he was unaware, then it is more reason why he should have been fired yesterday. If the minister can sit in his office and say that huge sums of money, tens of millions of Ghana cities belonging to the taxpayer, have been paid to an entity that he is engaged in, he's engaged with in terms of the procurement of assets, and he's not aware, then it is more reason why he should be removed from his post immediately. Okay, but, Mr. Boabi, but, but you see, okay, before, so before, you he comes in, before he comes <laughs> in, again, Jifa, I made a point in my earlier submission that there are people standing trial. For similar breaches, some of them cited the existence of internal ratification mechanisms. If we can at the stay PPE. with this, a PPE, yeah, I'll and yet, and yet, this. and yet, courts have sentenced them to prison terms. Indeed, we remove the whole head of the Ethical Commission, an independent yes, but he, he has your addressed that point no, 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 whether there is merit in this process to remove the minister. You need to kickstart the process. The president is unwilling to kickstart the process. Indeed, he should have fired him the day he went to parliament and admitted that he was not thinking straight you, in what, these would matters. You, what, would you you allow us to what would you have preferred? Let's say that minister that. Was, uh, was honest. Would you have preferred? No, honest about what? Listen, listen. If you, you admit no, that this Jifa, was the pressure, if you admit that, that he listen, took this decision because Jifa, of Jifa, the pressure, there were these decisions Jifa, to say that there are, Jifa, 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 there are 30 happens. million Ghanaians. To the extent that it was Mr. Ajima Menu who was picked to head that ministry, it meant that the president believed. That he had the capacity and competence and know how and knowledge so, so can we also to have run the ministry. <laughs> okay. so now, if it, it turns out, no, let, let, for now, if it turns out that he did not possess these qualities, he has no business remaining there. Okay. Now, what Thank he has done much. has so potentially cost us 16 million. Ghana. How do you go and pay? It's not yes, how do you go and pay for something? Listen, how do you go and buy the pay? How do you pay for something that you are not absolutely sure you are Because now the concern is, can we retrieve these monies? If it's very interesting the way. Ajma Menu's track record, political history, public service has come up. And that is the very reason why I'm saying that it is credible when he says that he was confused. <laughs> this is a man who has chaired the Public Accounts Committee, ranking member on the Public Accounts Committee and chair, I think, at some point. And he tells you that knowing how these things work, his engagement with the public sector and all that, he tells you that at a certain point in time, given the responsibility, he had to act this way. And he comes before the entire world and tells you that, look, where I was, I didn't even have room to look beyond these points. So the point I am making is that, yes, the NDC can use to uh, take this and run with it and compare all the previous trials in the country and otherwise. That's their business. The real business we have in this particular case is that you have a very experienced person who has conducted himself in a certain way against certain institutional norms of which he was very, very aware. Can we then conclude that it was deliberate? That he intended that money for his personal benefit? Because well, that is what the MDCI are implying. Yeah. And my position is that it cannot be the case <laughs> that with his experience, with his knowledge of procedural requirements, because everything he did would come out in the end. Isn't, there it, was all, going it, to isn't, be... isn't it all the more reason mm -hmm. that this is totally unacceptable. I th it, it may then be that the minister would look inward and say that, look, maybe I shouldn't continue on this tangent because then many will now want to even find out in the previous four years what other breaches may have happened. You know, what other love, mistakes, that rudimentary mistakes that should not have happened have happened. I would love 
that debate mm -hmm. to go on after the report is tabled in Parliament. Mm -hmm. Because then you will get the people's representatives. This was a bipartisan committee. This was not a committee of the MPP or the NDC. It's a bipartisan committee. I would love to hear the debate on the okay. report before we <laughs> take on other conclusions. But the point I am making is that one cannot presume that Mr. Ajman Menu ignored all these processes because he was seeking a personal interest, which is what the NDC <laughs> wanted to believe. But that otherwise, he why went out know? there, he wanted a personal interest, he, and he okay, ignored the processes. Put, let's put the personal interest aside. We I should. Think we the should. point is that certain mistakes were made, made. and you. somebody, somebody and, and, might be held accountable, accountable for so it. Those breaches, and so these have. other people also who in previous administrations, they were probably not even given the chance so, so, to, so for you, you have, to you hear have, an explanation. You have, a, you have a qualification on these matters, willingly, mm -hmm. causing, mm -hmm. willingly. That means you are deliberately, mm -hmm. intentionally. Like knowing and so knowing. you can yes. mistakenly cause problems How? which are not willing. It is not the case that every time something goes wrong, you willingly you make them that. go wrong in your personal interest. Okay. Please That's address the point the, I'm We need to wrap up on yes, this. Yes, but, but, uh, but we need, the point of it is us very important, the, the it's very important to the reputation and personal well-being of the minister that he is not misunderstood in public. He will have the opportunity to defend himself on the floor of the house, I'm sure. When the, uh, when the, the debate but, started yesterday, but it didn't really end conclusively. Yes, but, but that, that he is traduced in public. It, that will also come. The NDC will not let that chance go. But the <laughs> assumption being made that this was done to sidestep all those uh, institutional like processes right, <laughs> deliberately, <laughs> deliberately in his own interest is wrong, is palpably wrong, and it's not fair to the minister. If he's made mistakes, <laughs> and these mistakes were made in the course of duty because of the circumstances in which he found himself, I think at least his reputation should be given the benefit of the doubt. Sure. Quick one on the, on the amounts. Hopefully we will retrieve it the must amount. Be mm -hmm. It must be retrieved. It must be retrieved. Minus, the committee says minus the 20,000 uh, that which have been supplied. delivered I think it's already. only fair. Okay. Um, Dr. Ali, really you said a quick a, point just for a quick you. One. Yes. Uh, I don't think we should just stop at retrieving the money. Mm -hmm. Something has to be done. So About that people who? just don't think that people punished. just don't that think that you can do things and, and then, then you'll be asked to retrieve the money. That's that's it. It. We need to set a very serious precedent and make uh, those kind of things, ill breaches of the law, more costly. My, my last point is the fact that reading what I have read about the minister, given his extensive experience as a, as a legislature and a member of the executive, and all these things happening and all those experiences doesn't come into play, make me to think that there was some there was an, uh, there was a motive other than the collective benefit of the people Absolutely. and i think that has to be proven all right i think or, that, or that, tested uh -huh, in the way you said it has to be proven yes. so no, but i think now on the face of it we need uh, to, uh, to uh, look one question before we go you go back on this the minister the minister the minister no the minister no he knew and did not do it. So it's been, what, what it's been an interesting hot uh, 20 minutes so far. Uh, and it's the key point with me, Jifa Bampo. Follow the conversation. It's hashtag the key points. And we'll take a quick break and we'll come back. And when we come back, we take a look at the 29 years of the NPP. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Key Points Live on TV3 and 3FM. So almost some 30 years ago, multi-party democracy uh, started and it birthed the new patriotic uh, party. Over the week, the NPP commemorated in a muted manner due to the COVID pandemic, 29 years of their party. Let's hear John Buedu, who is the general secretary of the party. This country that has implemented so, more social intervention program than the new patriotic party. We have also initiated setting up of the party institute that will take party people through the study of communication, policy ana analysis, our ideology, understanding our ideology, research, and other related political issues. 
and that's John Buedu. He's the general secretary of the MPP. So he says that in as much as the party is uh, a centre-right party, they have implemented uh, the most significant social economic interventions in the country and listed some of them. Uh, the president, Nana Akufuado, was a national organiser of the party in the early, early days and has been with the party really from the very beginning. Let's hear what he had to say on that commemoration day. And I'm very, very confident of it, that on the 7th of December, 2024, the new MPP presidential candidate is going to win the election of 2024. So our, our objective, our responsibility is to do whatever it is necessary to make sure that that victory is forthcoming. We have to continue our way forward in Ghana. We cannot accept the backsliding that takes place every now and then. It hasn't benefited our nation, and it will not benefit our nation. The foundations that we're laying today for the prosperity of our nation are going to be shaken if, again, through our own fault, we allow the path to progress to be diverted. <laughs> and you're welcome back. So you heard the president there talking about what he sees uh, in terms of the future, looking immediately at 2024 and really uh, for the future. The party, the NPP's uh, slogan is development in freedom. And I guess it's not just a slogan for them, it's meant to be for all of us. So have they delivered that for us? Let me start with uh, Dr. Ali Dusedu because he's a political scientist and you've certainly been following the politics of our country for a while, have studied it. Would you say that the NPP over 29 years have delivered on what they've promised? Yeah, I, I, to some extent, I think uh, the MPP as a party have contributed to deepening our multi-party democracy in this country. And, and I think you can trace the, the traditional route of the MPP to, I think, 1947, yes. when the UGCC Four was August. formed, 4th August. So I think that, that seed of democratic development and freedom was sowed on that particular day and the permutations up to, up to the, up to the full for public. If, if I want to assess the MPP, I'll look at it from three forms. One, I'll look at it from the theoretical perspective. That, that basically has to do with the ideology and whether they have stick to their ideology over time. And then two, so it's both theory and practical. And the practical, I'll focus on the MPP as a political institution and whether it has lived up to that particular mandate. And then MPP as a government. What, what it has done. So uh, as an institution, as a political institution, the MPP has done it quite a lot. It has been able to train and build the capacity of its core membership from the student level up to national political level. They have produced leaders. They have built capacity of, of various institutions. They have set up a permanent bureaucracy as a political party to be able to help uh, the capacity of individuals who identify themselves as members of the party and to translate that capacity that they have earned to the collective development of the country. Yes, political parties generally face a lot of challenges in the country and the MPP is not immune from that. But on that particular front, they have done relatively well. Looking at the history that they have traveled up to the fourth republic, they have really done so well. In, in terms of governance, there is a kind of mixed thing. They, they've done a lot in deepening our democracy, passing laws, uh, implementing uh, policies and programs that seeks to improve the lives and the livelihood of the people. They have also made a lot of governance mistakes, you know. Uh, there have been a decline in the ranking of uh, uh, press freedom, uh, the alleged uh, harassment of, of journalists, and then uh, largely the politicization of, of state institutions and all those things. When you are assessing them, looking at the very good policies they've implemented, the uh, uh, social intervention programs, deepening our democracy, passing legislation that makes Ghana democracy grow, they are all part of assessment of the governor, not the, the ideology. And I like what the president said about the fact that on 7th uh, 2024, no, is it 2025, yeah. uh, the pow power will be handed over to, to an MPP government. I, I think, I think it, there's still time to, to debate this. <laughs> no, one, because 
No, if you look at the political ideology of I the think that I think the, the, the critical thing he put there is it doesn't matter who will be the flag bearer. It, it matters. Whoever. We'll, we'll talk about it, but I yes. guess so, that was so, an interesting so that, that, that is going to feed, you, that is going to feed into, my, um, into my ideology. So, yes. Felix is salivating. So, so <laughs> in, 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 in terms of ideology, the MPP is not only a, a center right, but it is a, a conservative party. And see, conservatism has some peculiar traditions, especially in terms of what? Respect for customs, traditions, and continuity. The MPP over the years, that's what we call uh, the, the principle of prescription. They have respected the core founder members of their party, and they have held them in high esteem. The party realized that you, we can't be where we are if we didn't stood on the shoulders of giants. So they have always mentioned their founding members, they have cherished them, they have named uh, state institutions. In, they've, they've done a lot of things to, to reward them. So the custom and the traditions go. But if you look at, there's a competing interest when you look at customs, traditions, and what? Continuity. The, there are two basic, basic issues, permanence and progression. The permanence has to do with the fact that they are highly suspicious of people who are not core part of their membership. So that's why people think that climbing in, in, in progressing in the MPP is quite a daunting task compared to the NDC because there is a queue. You have to obey the queue, respect the tradition, follow people who have toiled earlier. So that kind of a thing brings that element of permanence because you cannot disregard the tradition of the party. And there are a lot of people who are still hardcore conservative people who believe in permanence and retaining the traditions and customs of the party. But there are also people who are more progressive you see, laws or ideology is not cast in stone. You look at the circumstances, the opportunity, and then you gradually liberalize or change or progress in terms of those things. So people are thinking that over the years, you see, for example, the social democratic, uh, a liberal democratic party shouldn't pride itself with implementing social intervention policies, mm -hmm. theoretically. But this is what the journal is looking for. Because over the years, you've seen that things have changed. And you have to respond to what? The needs of the people based on the circumstance, no matter what the ideology says. But lastly, people think that given, what, given how far we have come, we need to disregard that custom impartation bed and look at progression. Can we get people who are more progressive and then we liberalize gradually to be able to attain what is going to happen? And that is going to be the major contest in who leads the party in 2024. Is it going to be Alan who is more conservative traditional and people who believe in conservatism and tradition that, oh, uh, President Kufo contested Adu Boahene before he led Adana Ad Adodonka Kufado contested Kufo, Alan contested uh, uh, Nana, so he should lead? Or where does Dr. Bamiya Mahamadu come in? So the issue of progression, that is, and the issue of permanence, it's going to be a major ideological fight moving into 2024. And in most cases, this has collapsed political parties. And in some cases, they have rebranded political parties and make them stronger. So it's still something very important that we need to look at moving I, into 2024. I, and I deliberately wanted you to give us this exposition for the benefit of many young ones who may be watching and may not have this kind of backstory in terms of the MPP and, and the like. At the time I became a journalist, that was during the era of... Uh, um, Dan Botre, who was general secretary and uh, the chairman was Haruna Eseku and the like, but kind of followed them up until now. So, um, Mr. Bwabing Asamwa, I mean, kudos, the MPP at 29, other parties have fallen by the wayside. Um, would you ascribe to the issues of, you know, p looking at permanence, ensuring continuity, tradition uh, as part of the success? I thank you uh, very much for giving the MPP the opportunity to be in the public space on your platform this morning. And uh, I'm glad your platform, Dr. Alidu, has endorsed the MPP. <laughs> <laughs> Academically. Academically. Oh. <laughs> Is that an endorsement? I didn't say politically. <laughs> okay. okay. Academically. <laughs> and, and, and described, literally, in his opinion, who we are ideologically and the way we position ourselves. In, in several respects, he may not be far uh, from wrong, but, but we are who we are, and then we know our history, and we know the way uh, forward, as it were. So there are certain things that ideologically uh, may not seem to sit with what we say we are, but pragmatically, leading Ghana, we seek to do, because that's the right thing to do for Ghana.
Ghanaians, and that's what will take our society forward. So, though we are conservative, we are also pragmatic. We are right of centre, but we are pragmatic. This is what Kufour described as capitalism with the human face. That is how come in the society we are, people needing to build social capital so rapidly, the MPP has taken it upon itself in its role as a genuine society builder, as a genuine nation builder, to take on the social interventions required to bring our social capital up to speed, education, health, so that the people can realize their private talents for the benefit of the whole nation. So having said that, uh, let me begin from the end, being the president's statement and how uh, Doc described it. Uh, my understanding of what the president said is that our record is so solid that the, our contention for continued leadership is not necessarily about the individual who steps into his shoes as president, but the collective record of the party, the ability of the party to drive things forward. Because the party owns the policies that the government is implementing. The party has taken the policies before developed. The party is taking on the policies and Ado has developed and is implementing. And these policies are deeply rooted in our psyche, our liberal traditions, and the way we see that our society must be built. And therefore, if you have the party imbibing these policies and traveling forward with these policies, if you look at our manifestos from, from 92 all the way through, they just keep building up on these themes. And you find them linked backwards to the popular front uh, party, Progress Party, and all the way back to UGCC. That focus on building up human rights. That focus on entrenching the rule of law. And what is the benefit of rule of law? It gives fair opportunity to everybody. It elevates law above human beings. And it therefore produces certainty and predictability in society. That's why we are so fixed on rule of law. You move beyond individual human beings, the whims and enterprises of individuals, and you get a situation where anybody, without recourse to your status, your or your gender, anything, uh, uh, your ethnic extraction, have equal opportunity to the benefits the state can confer. That's why rule of law is so important to us. And then, of course, the freedoms of speech, association, and all that, which we have championed since the UGCC days, complements rule of law. Because we believe that when the individual is free, the individual can explode their talents in the framework of the social capital that the government provides. And in doing so, the individual is fulfilled. It can lift other people. That's our, the private sector part of what we do. That once the individual is empowered, equipped, that individual can bring innovation, productivity to another level and drag along another person. So you take away the burden of everything being on the government, especially employment. So, so we have that three-pronged thing. You're doing the rule of law, you are ensuring human rights, and then you are engaging the private sector to take advantage of this environment and, and bring itself and all others up along with all of us. So what you do is that you protect their rights. and their, uh, 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 So you have our motto, development in freedom. We will develop in freedom. It is still a heavily contested situation, and Doc will, will uh, agree with me that there are still those political scientists who don't believe that democracy <laughs> leads to development. <laughs> there are two different things. That, the fact that you are entitled to vote does not mean you'll be well off. It's still a debate. But we in the MPP believe strongly that the more free you are, within the limits, within the rules, the more likely that you contribute to development in a better structured manner. And this nexus was developed by Dr. J.B. Dankwa, well, well, well before, years before, uh, when he made that famous statement that the uh, MPP now has taken on as lodestone. Mm. So yeah. I'll come back to you on mm. that. And uh, oh. Felix, I know no, you've been taking up up copious notes. Let me, let, me, let me just wrap up okay, quickly. Just let, me just, let's, let me just, so, so that day, uh, 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 the, the event the we had the that commemoration, day was yes. on two legs. Mm -hmm. Apart from the theme, stability, prosperity, and continuity. And stability in the sense that we have contributed to a stable democratic process over the 29 years based on our belief in rule of law and all those things. So we have a stable society. And that is, political stability is a brand that Ghana 
is benefiting from worldwide, political stability. Then, prosperity. We are growing the economy. Every time we are in charge, we believe we add qualitative growth to this economy, which is of a permanent nature. And so that is why we are asking Ghana to continue as in power. Continuity. We are asking Ghana to So on that day, we're looking at two pillars. One, thanking all of Ghana, including the NDC. <laughs> Thanking all of Ghana for this collective enterprise that has brought us this far and expecting that we will continue in that vein. And the 2020 election, because of COVID, was one of the ones where the system was most threatened. There were voices about not having an election at all, if you remember. The president was very resolute and resilient. And we had one of the best elections ever. So that thank you to the people of Ghana. The second leg of the thank you is that we are asking Ghanaians to look at our record in government. And continuous power. And that's where the president comes in and says that with that record, don't over focus on the leadership struggle. It will come. The president is going out of office. He will not extend his term by constitutional fiat. It, he's going out of office. So somebody must lead us. Question is who does? There are about five or six claimants, but we all know that there are two front runners. And, and uh, <laughs> Doc has been able Doc, to <laughs> ideologize them already. already. Yeah. <laughs> I would not go that far. But I would say that the MPP as a political entity is determined to have a fair race. That everybody involved will be given the opportunity to demonstrate to the MPP first in primaries what they can do, what they add to the ticket. Because the ticket is the party's achievements, the two previous presidents, and the policies that Ghanaians feel uh, enamored of, the policies that are benefiting Ghanaians as we speak. That is the bedrock. And then that leader is seeking to add on. So the value addition is what we are going to look at. Who adds value to that bedrock, which is the party? And it will be contested in a primary. We, have to, uh, we are very zealous and enthusiastic. We love competition. So already there's a bit of competitiveness and the party has taken steps to rein in uh, excess competition at this stage so that nobody picks too early the party's view is that anything you do now is just demonstrate that you have an interest in running you are not going to be giving different policy measures because you are part of a government that was well, elected seven months ago on a clear ticket and that ticket is being implemented so you are not coming to appeal to the public to lead the party in the next three years on the basis of different policies. So if it is just about introducing yourself to the public, we in the party believe that already, based on Dr. Alidu's analysis, the progressives, the conservatives, whatever, in the history of the party, we know who are in contention. So there is a code of conduct seeking to restrict or seeking to moderate the ground now until the time when the general secretary the political party says, now we are free to go out there. Then we we'll see policies and programs, the value addition that these candidates bring to us. And I'm telling you, it is that process that the president is saying that whoever triumphs will only be adding value to the ticket and we should then win. So it is not the other way around. It is not the personality who is going to win as the election. It is the value addition the personality brings to the solid party platform that we have already, the platform of policies that are already benefiting Ghanaians. All right. Um, Mr. Kwachi Fosu, the NPP, 29 years of it, they've become formidable in, you know, matching the NDC as well, because the NDC came, had the benefit of the revolutionary era and almost the same people coming in, presenting strongly in 92, even though the NPP boycotted uh, those uh, elections afterwards, I mean, they did the parliamentary, but then decided to boycott the presidential, and so weren't even in parliament entirely. Then in 96, they came in, led by J.H. Uh, Mensa at that time, of course. And I guess... Is, no, yeah, go for Jacob, no, not at the, as president. I mean, in, in parliament. parliament. Yes. yes. yes, yes. And so they've also grown that capacity. I'm sure there are many people who may have not thought that they would, you know, come this far and really be a formidable competition to the NDC. Well, I mean, to the extent that they are one of two dominant, dominant parties, parties yeah. in Ghana, you could say that they've made a contribution. Except that the records would show that they were disruptive at the very beginning for very frivolous reasons. They decided to abstain from the drawing up of the constitution.
which has become the bedrock <laughs> upon which this whole democratic experiment has been built thus far. Again, when elections were held and they were thrashed convincingly at the polls, they decided that they were not going to go to parliament. So for four years, they deprived their membership and the section of Ghanaians who believed in the ideologies a voice in parliament. Later on, they decided to mainstream and do the things that regular political parties are supposed to do. So they've, they've evolved from a very disruptive force to a force that has shown that at least they are willing to take part uh, in the democratic exercise. Again, uh, congratulations will be in order to the extent that they are marking a milestone. But you see, the MPP has a pension for saying one thing and doing the other. You know, they are a bundle of contradictions. They engage a lot in sloganeering that does not translate into substantive actions on the ground. So for instance, there is a party that claims at the very beginning that they were formed on the basis of intellectualism and deep thought and, uh, if you like, uh, contributions that had finesse, uh, contributions that were substantive. And yet, if you compare the party today to what their founding fathers say they stood for, they are barely recognizable. They have rapidly descended into a party that now believes in integrity, state-sponsored violence. I mean, you have a situation where a whole party can be in power, and yet clad party militia with arms and ammunition of the state and send them to assault members of the opposition who are doing nothing more than participating in an election. We have had instances where these tacks have actually been integrated into regular security forces and they are engaged in actions that are extrajudicial, that simply are not lawful and nothing is done about it. A party that purports to subscribe to intellectualism does not behave this way. Again, there's a party that says that they believe in freedoms. And yet today, at no point under the Fourth Republic, have we had the freedoms of people emasculated the way that it has happened today? You are in the media. As I speak to you, two prominent opposition stations, Radio Gold and Munti FM, remain closed for reasons that are frivolous and completely untenable. They have been closed. And the reason why they've been closed is that they are known to be very critical of the new Petroleum Party and their leader. No party can subscribe to freedom and behave in the manner that they have behaved. Again, there's a party that says that they are willing to run the country well, run the country on the basis of good governance, on the basis of rule of law. We just finished discussing the Sputnik matter, in which our laws were vandalized, were violated with impunity, and no actions have been taken. There's a party that is superintending corruption on a grand scale. We are talking governmental corruption in a manner that we have never seen before. And I could cite examples for you. We are talking about a party that has practiced nepotism in its very worst forms. <laughs> the, 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 the administration that President Akufuado has presided is brimming with his relatives. These are things that you do not do when you subscribe to the ideology that the MPP says it subscribes to. The other issue is that they suffer an identity crisis. Whereas they claim to be a center-right party that hankers after conservatism, they have drifted into shallow populism, all in a manner intended to win elections. So you find that they do things that are completely diametrically opposite what they say they stand for. But, and, how, but if you say, and I'm sorry to interrupt sure. you, because when you say shallow populism, I'll explain to are you. you saying that free SH is shallow see, populism? They go about saying this, that, listen, listen, people benefit listen, listen, from listen, it. Are listen, you saying that look, NHIS let me tell you is, let me tell you is populism? Jifa, are you, just Jifa, a quick one, okay. are you saying that the, the um, you know, these policies to, to provide or improve the lives of people like LEAP is, is shallow populism. I'm you see, not listen sure to, listen to the narrative. Listen, listen to the narrative. They say that they are engaged in social interventions. Because we have, because no. the truth is in Ghana, it's a, it's no, listen, a, a listen. developing country in Malaysia. If, 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 if you let me make, yes, my, sir. If let me make my point. You, just thought, you see, what they have done is that for partisan reasons, they have deliberately chosen a very narrow, narrow interpretation of what the social intervention is. And that all that they think constitutes a social intervention is to say that something is free. And they completely disregard any other investment that is made in the social sector. When you speak about a social intervention, you are simply saying that government is investing in the social sector. So education, health, social services, provision of basic needs of people, all of that constitutes social intervention. But to the extent that they ascribe social interventions to things that are free, you can accuse them of adopting a very narrow interpretation. The truth is that the MPP will not come close to the NDC when you do a sector by sector analysis of which party has contributed to Ghana's development. I'm surprised that President Kufado can actually mount the platform and say that whichever candidate they present, he will do an election. Of course, given that he's the leader of the MPP, you cannot expect him to say anything else. But if the track record of his government 
were ever to be set against the benchmarks that are to be used to assess whether a party continues in government. They will be kicked out at the earliest opportunity. As I speak to you, they have run down the economy. <laughs> Our debt is so huge and humongous that we are not in a position to pay. Our debts are also sustainable, as I speak to you. Only two weeks ago, the minority laid bare the facts. We used data to establish that they have driven us to a level where we cannot pay our debts. And that very, very soon, if a decision is not taken on the way forward, we are going to be default on our debts. As I speak to you, they, they owe so much to contractors, to suppliers. Look, they cannot even finance the printing of textbooks for basic schools that have been in operation for the last two terms. Okay, so just on the owing of contracts, no, I just that. need mm -hmm. to point to you that mm -hmm. the roads minister has announced payment well, of they some 800 billions. million. Jifa, They've they announced over payment 2 billion. of 260 Jifa, to the Jifa, fertilizer Jifa, company. So owe, I'm just Jifa, They owe that. over 2 billion Ghana cities contractors. They owe over 780 million Ghana cities. Jifa, Jifa, so these are, these are drops in the ocean. But the reason why they are here is that they have mismanaged the economy. He claims that oh, whenever they are in power, they make qualitative improvements on the Ghanaian economy. Check the records. The highest ever growth that this economy has recorded was under the NDC, 14.4% in 2011. I thought, I thought that was under President, was under President Mills. Because no, no, because, because President Mills. Oil. No, no. Okay, I'll have to if if you make me make my point, yeah. listen. I'm saying that the highest ever growth rate recorded in Ghana's history, economically, is 14.4% under President Mills. Now you can divide that to see the contribution of oil. Oil contributed under 7%. The real sector, which comprises a great manufacturing and all the other sectors that do not depend on oil, grew by about 8%. The and same oil, oh, you but Mr. Bobby, you know, let me make my point. I'll give you time, so I just need, okay. so once Felix makes listen, a point, I'll go for listen, a break and then check, I'll come check back and take Check the highest ever growth rate. This was 9.2% under President Kufo. President Kufo inherited two more oil wells when the NDC left power, and yet the highest he could master was 7% in 2017. So, when you look at the facts, you look at the figures, go to education. Who has made the biggest contributions? What was the biggest problem confronting Ghanaians in terms of education? Access. Children had to go and sit under trees. We removed over 2,000 of those schools under trees. Go to health. President Kufadu has been president for five years, going into his sixth year. He does not boast a single district hospital. President Mahama has about 14 district hospitals to his name. He has over 22 polyclinics. President Kufadu does not have any. Look at the retooling that we did. We spent close to $300 million retooling 125 hospitals across Ghana, all of them in the public sector. President Kufadu does not have such a record. Okay, but Look, at you, Look at water. Look at water. Jifa, mm. when we came to power in 2009, under half of Ghanaians had access to water. By the time we left power, we had added 7 million more people to those who had access to water. They have been in power for the last six years. Tell me what substantive contributions they've made. I'm sure you are familiar with the case of Adenta. He, he was MP for Adenta some time ago. And he, he is very familiar with what I'm saying. For about 15 years, there were people who had not seen water run through their tasks. President Mama and the, uh, the NDC government removed it. What is President Kufadu's record there? Okay, but, I could go but on what I would like yeah. to refer to is, mm -hmm. you, are, you are talking about the water issue, mm -hmm. but I know that President uh, Kufo initiated projects that in they don't the come, end listen. delivered they don't come that close. water. No, yeah. no, 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 no. But then, but then yeah. even then, mm -hmm. a lot of the references you make mm -hmm. is to the current Kufuado administration. I'm not exactly sure if that's fair because we're talking about MP P29 oh, but of years, course, but yes, and, and former but, President Kufo but did see, some certain things. We are the so, national health insurance um, see, was, is a major legacy. Jifa, true. Jifa, we know before even, Kufo, Jubilee, even Jubilee House of well, I will not necessarily yes, count it no, but, but you see the point that sense was good. Jifa, Jifa, but at least Jifa, that Jifa, is something Jifa, that was before done. President there were a number of roads also. Oh, sure, I know. Sure, so, sure, so sure. make it look as if sure, they Jifa, haven't done Jifa, anything. Jifa, I'm not exactly Jifa, sure if that's also before, fair. over oh, but the period been so. in government. I've not said so. Even President Liman, his government, which was the shortest lived in our history, did something. Even the payment of salaries on loan is a contribution. Because government needs to mobilize the resources to pay public sector workers so they can eke out a living at the end of the month. So it is a contribution. But I'm talking about its overall impact in the development of Ghana. Before President Kufuwa came was President Rollins, who had done so much. Indeed, President Rollins has a distinction of adding 200 more senior high schools to the existing stock. It was President Rollins who gave three modern regional hospitals to the central Bunohafu and water regions. So I have not even counted those. I have restricted myself to just what we did in the last eight years that Ghanaians gave us the opportunity to run this country. So if you added President Rawlings' tenor to that of Mills and Mahama, 
we will dwarf the MPP in every single sector. But they have this pension for loudness. You know, going out there and making lofty claims that they do not subscribe to. Why? This is a, a, a party that in opposition harangued the party that was in power, claimed that they will fight corruption and that they will protect the public press, only for them to come to power and open up the public press to systematic rape and abuse. All manner of things have been done <laughs> against the public <laughs> press. <laughs> against the public press. So I need you to wrap up on that. Yes, I'm going to wrap yes. up. So, and so the point Mr. is that... Has somewhere, you so, have so my, time my, so my other point yes. is that... So this, this, this misplaced overconfidence on the part of President Kufa that they are going to win, even if they present the goods. Oh, <laughs> yes. he didn't say that. <laughs> oh, I'm only, I get you, there's, buddy. There's yeah, something called hyperbolic. I get that, but yeah, it's, it's not everyone who may get it, but it's, yes. a, it's, it's a hyperbolic yes, statement. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a figure of speech. Today is <laughs> no, 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 no. This one is a figure of speech. Yes, so essentially, he's saying that no matter who they present. It's not about, it's just not about the individual per se. It's about yes. their record. So, so that, that, that stands to reason that depending on the work he has done, it doesn't matter who they present. They are going to win. I'm saying that it is misplaced because if indeed he is assessed on the basis of performance alone, he should not even have won the 2020 elections. All right. If so performance alone was the reason why people voted for government. In any event, we know that there's an established trend of eight years. The reason why the MPP crossed the Rubicon was the eight-year rule. Okay. So and having been... Look, President Kufo, I was a critic of President Kufo, but I can tell you that President Kufo was far better than President... Akufado. But even then, they lost okay, in 2008. So, so I'm not sure where the confidence is coming from. Okay, so we'll come back oh, to that because I know that, that the eight year Rubicon will come up. It's still the key points here on TV3 and 3FM. My name is Jifa Bampo, and we take a quick break and we'll be right back. We'll hear from Mr. Bwabing Asamwa, the communications director of the NPP, and then, of course, Dr. Ali Duseidu, senior lecturer with the University of Ghana's political science department.